traveling to consciousness, exploring spiritual journeys to find answers in uncertainty. What is up, Conscious Monkeys? Welcome to another episode of Traveling to Consciousness. I'm your host, Clayton Cuteri. Today, we have the founder of Conscious Technologies, LLC, another conscious individual, whose mission is to bring forth technologies that support the harmony of mankind and the world at large. He has invented EMF harmonizing units for your phone, your keychains, laptops, and even a unit that will harmonize your entire house. And this was blowing me away when I was kind of reading this on the website, which, you know, it even says their whole goal is to harmonize the EMF signal. They don't want to block it out and they're changing the spin field. And I don't, I have like a, what would you call it? Probably a high, uh, college education of physics. So we'll try to break it down for anyone who's like, what the hell do any of those words mean? <laughs> Cause I'm a little lost myself. He has also uh, created a meditation map, which helps you elevate your frequency, reduce stress, emotional blocks. And if this doesn't sound wild enough, he's alluded to using the astral realm, such as like astral projection, lucid dreaming to actually help create these inventions. So guys, buckle up. This is going to be a wild one. And after you adjust your seatbelts, Conscious Monkeys, welcome to the show, Ross Newcourt, Kurt. Ugh. Oh, I messed it up. <laughs> Ross Newkirk. <laughs> so Ross, Thank thanks for so being much. here. Yeah, I'm yeah. so glad to be here, Clayton. I appreciate the invite. Yeah, man. I'm excited. I saw you on that podcast and I was like, man, they're, they're not they're not asking the good questions. I was like, come on, we gotta get <laughs> we gotta get to the meat of this. So so what I guess I don't even really know where to start here. <laughs> Do we start with trying to understand what EMF signals are? Because that's probably something that we're all exposed to on the physical level. So if I'm five years old, how would you explain EF, EMF signals to me? So an EMF signal is uh, stands for electromagnetic frequency. And um, a lot of people, when they hear EMF, they think of uh, bad, you know, it's really bad but our hearts give off EMF. There's lots of things that give off an electromagnetic frequency. It's just whether it is in alignment with the biology or not. Um, and a lot of synthetic man-made EMF is not in line with biology. And um, it in fact gives off a torsion field or an information field that um, is negatively polarized, um, uh, meaning it's not in, in alignment with uh, biology. And um, it actually has a left-handed torsion field or information field. Um, and our hearts give off EMF, um, but it has our hearts and uh, life in, in general gives off a right-handed torsion uh, or information field. So we're able to use information field technology to um, actually change that information component to man-made EMF to make it in harmony because you can't block the signal um, from your cell phone or your laptop or your dirty electric. Uh, you can, in some cases, uh, mitigate some of that, you know, especially with dirty electric. Um, but with your cell phone, for instance, if you block the signal, like some of the technologies um, claim to do, then your phone's not going to work. Um, uh, so if your phone's not working, yes, you were able to block the signal. Um, but, uh, you know, how, uh, useful is that if you have a, a device where you can't actually use your phone? So if you're, if your phone's able to communicate with the, the tower, um, by definition, you haven't blocked it. Now, a lot of people have different shields where they put, um, a shield on one side of their cell phone that's up against their body. It sounds great, you know, but if you're walking and the cell phone tower is to your left, and your phone is on your right hand side, the way uh, um, these frequencies work is they go in a straight line. So they don't somehow go around you because of the shield and connect with the cell phone tower. And in some cases, they're not helpful at all because your cell phone is amping up and boosting its signal. You know, we've all experienced that when we're driving through the mountains, especially, you know, many years ago when there weren't as many cell phone towers, um, your cell phone's actually. Um, boosting up its sig signal in order to connect to these towers. Um, but we um, 
found a way. I worked with my father, uh, Mark Newkirk, who was a uh, materials engineer and a world-class scientist. And he ended up working um, with some cutting edge scientists that um, were from the former Soviet Union. Um, and uh, I know there's a bad rap over there right now, but there's a lot of beautiful people in every country. Um, and these scientists had studied um, uh, information fields and uh, they had actually gotten, they got uh, um, half a billion dollars, $500 million from the government to study these information fields. So they're obviously <laughs> real for someone to continue funding, uh, you know, this, you know, with $500 million. And so um, uh, he, he was able to um, connect with it, um, two of these scientists and they um, shared some of the information that they you know, had come to learn and he was able to decipher it. And it, it wasn't a long term relationship. You know, he met him a few times. And uh, and then out of that, um, he started downloading ideas. And I don't want to jump ahead of us, but um, in order to help create other technologies um, that came through. So that's sort of what an EMF is and and uh, um, and so forth. Cool. Yeah, let's, let's not get too far down yet, <laughs> because I, I, it sounded to me that the key to this is you were saying there's a left-handed field that's produced by your phone, but yet mm -hmm. were you saying that we produce humans produce a right-handed field? Yeah. Um, it, what is yeah, that? You're, is that like the way that the electrical signals are being like radiating off of us or? <clears throat> yeah. You know, it's, um, it's a little hard to, you know, wrap our minds around and understand, but um, it's, it's a, it's a waveform that's being given off. And if they aren't in sync and in harmony, there's, um, sort of a battle that's going on with, within, you know, the man-made EMF and the, the body. And, um, they've done tests and studies, you know, on rats, you know, um, uh, um, using, uh, uh, electromagnetic frequencies and, and seeing, you know, how, um, you know, and, and uh, hatch rates of chickens where they take, you know, a certain amount of eggs and they put a cell phone, you know, next to these eggs and uh, the hatch rate is drastically reduced versus, um, you know, uh, a, uh, um, uh, a group of chicken eggs that um, didn't have a cell phone. And then they also did it with shungite, which, um, you know, we use a lot of shungite in our, our products. And shungite is a uh, amazing you know, some call it a mineral, you know, it, it looks like a mineral. It's a, uh, um, black rock, uh, you know, uh, and it comes in different forms and different grades. Um, it's only found on one, uh, one place on the whole planet. The best, um, interpretation of, um, what Shungite is, you know, um, that I've heard that I, you know, resonate more with is that it was some kind of, um, you know, meteorite that had hit. Um, it's a, it's a huge mineral deposit actually in Russia and um, uh, they uh, use this and they've, um, the Russians have done a lot of studies with uh, electromagnetic frequencies and this, um, this mineral called shungite. Um, and they found that it is able to, it has this composition um, that is able to transmute and change uh, frequencies, um, yeah, man-made frequencies, you know, specific uh, EMFs and, uh, um, it has some pretty remarkable, you know, qualities and people are using this stone also for water purification, late stage air purification. Um, a lot of, you know, healers and, and meditators use, you know, this mineral as well. Um, but the deposit, they make you make it sound like it's extremely rare. It's rare in that it's only found in one place on earth. Um, but the deposit I calculated, um, you know, a while back, it's about like two and a half times the size of Rhode Island. <laughs> so oh, wow. it's a big deposit. Um, and, uh, and so this they, was a meteor that hit into Russia. How long ago would that have happened? I, I think millions of years oh, ago, okay. you know, a long, long time ago. And, um, so it's under the soil and they dig it up and, and it's sort of this gray, like, um, uh, you know, charcoalish looking rock, you know, grayish black. Um, and you, you hold it and you get black all over your hands. Um, and then they have um, about, I think it's 1% of the elite Shungite, or, uh, the Shungite is called elite Shungite. And that um, looks like, um, uh, actually it looks like coal, um, you know, uh, shiny, you know, um, uh, bright. And uh, the other looks like charcoal from like your, your uh, charcoal grill or something. And uh, the elite looks like um, shiny, you know, uh, uh, coal. And it's um, very lightweight. Uh, it's very brittle. It's hard to carve and so forth. 
but um, both of those regular shungite and elite shungite have you know specific important qualities to them so we use those actually in a lot of our emf technology along with other minerals and materials and even uh, geometries that are cast into um, some of our our products as well Um, right we've had uh oh go ahead and yeah that sounds like something that I was re- when I was reading on your thing, it said it sounded like you used, I, I guess, this mineral shungite. You used sound. You used geometry. You used like a bunch of different. It seemed like layers in order to, you know, produce. I guess these EMF harmonizing units. So, you know, what I guess what ratio goes into all these things? Because like I, I think the one for the house seemed like it had like a sound in it or a subwoofer, but then. You know, you had EMF harmonizers for your phone, which just seemed like a very thin, you know, plastic thing that you just put on your phone. So does it like vary what you use or like the geometry? Is there a geometry of the Shungite that you have found is like the most effective? Yeah, you know, um, there's specific uh, amounts and quantities that have, uh, you know, been given, you know, to us, which I know we're going to talk more about how to tap into uh, higher awarenesses. Um, and, uh, but also the coupling of, uh, other materials, um, like 24 karat gold, we use a lot of 24 karat gold, you know, in small amounts, but, um, in our products as well. And, you know, as, as a lot of people, um, you know, like 24 karat gold, cause they use that for the astronaut helmets to block radiation when they're up, you know, in space and so forth. But, um, uh, I'll, I'll share a, uh, a little um, something that uh, has never been shared before with anyone. We'll share oh, it with your users it. here. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so the if you look at, um, uh, and I'm doing this to you know help humanity here because I think these technologies and, and so forth need to be shared and, and get out in a bigger way. But if you actually look at um, Shungite, um, especially uh, um, the just the regular standard Shungite, a lot of times you'll see um, little... Uh, seams or um, uh, uh, evidences uh, 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 and glow of pyrite, you know, within uh, the deposit. And what came to me in a download, and I've never seen this anywhere else, never heard anyone talk about it, um, is that um, that uh, if it was just gold, um, people would be mining the Shungite for the wrong reasons and ripping it up and destroying it. And, you know, like man tends to do. Um, However, it was actually a message or a um, hint, if you will, a clue that um, we're actually supposed to use 24 karat gold uh, mixed with shungite. And for whatever reason, when you mix um, 24 karat gold um, or, or even other, you know, um, carats of gold, but we use 24 karat um, in with shungite, there's an extra activation. So. I don't know if anyone else in, you know, uh, the world has, you know, heard this or, you know, whatnot, but that's what had come through is that that's very important to use. Um, so that's what we do. I actually have my cell phone here and, you know, this little, um, you know, disc on the back, you know, has a whole bunch of different minerals and shungite and there's, there's gold in there as well. Um, yeah. Very cool. And so then a couple questions here. Uh, number one, (laughs) I guess it it sounds like, do you melt down the Shungite and then melt down the gold and like kind of blend it at a specific ratio? And then let's say pour it into a mold that then becomes that little stopper that you're putting on the back of your phone. Yeah. You know, um, we have rock grinders and so we, we buy, um, you know, the Shungite right from the source, you know, cause there are imposters out there. Um, uh, Shungite is very conductive. So if you take a, uh, um, a, uh, conductive meter and, and, um, it'll actually conduct electricity. So you can take, take a, uh, um, uh, they call it the flashlight test. So if you take a flashlight and you unscrew the back end of the flashlight off and touch a piece of shungite to the actual battery, and then the other to the little spring and the, the butt of your flashlight, your flashlight will light up, you know, it conducts like a wire. Uh, okay. Um, so like the shungite's and- in between the battery and the bottom of the phone. Exactly. Or, uh, um, in the bottom, uh, um, sorry, this was for a flashlight. Yeah. Yeah. The bottom of the flashlight. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, um, uh, so, um, but what we do is we, we crush up the minerals and we have a specific ratio of everything that we're told to use and, uh, you know, mix in the gold and every single one of our cell phone harmonizers and, uh, pocket harmonizers and so forth 
they actually get mixed individually because each mineral has a different weight, you know, content to it. So we can't just take a big blender or something and mix it all up and just start pouring a ton at once. Okay. We actually have to uh, mix them in with, uh, we use an eco non-toxic epoxy, you know, that we use it's safe to breathe and safe for the environment and so forth, which most epoxies are not, and they're extremely toxic. Um, and so that's why it looks all nice and refined is, um, but the minerals are all in there. Um, but it has a tremendously high rate of uh, shungite and uh, elite shungite and uh, uh, and so forth in there. But That's and so then cool. we also cast geometries that are cast inside it too. That we make physical geometries that are dropped in each one as well. And w- uh, what do you mean by cast inside it? Like would would you be forming these? So you're breaking down the rocks and you're, I guess, mm-hmm. mixing it with gold. Is there like? Do the rocks come to a powder and then you're dropping this powder into a geometric formation that is then what is changing essentially the spin of that EMF field? Or I guess. Oh, oh I see what you're saying. Um, no, um, the, uh, you know, some of the minerals we use are in powder form. Uh, some are in granular form that we um, grind up and sift. Um, but uh, yeah, it uh, just the characteristic for whatever reason of, um, these minerals together, um, coupled with the geometry, you know, and I'm sure the intention as well, um, uh, you know, ends up, you know, uh, creating this coherent field. Um, and, you know, we've, we've, uh, we've tested, you know, a lot of people like, oh, well, you know, how do you know it works and so forth? Well, we've tested it, um, using kinesiology, which isn't an extremely well accepted method, but, um, it, it, uh, is definitely accurate and works. Um, We've also tested it with kids where we um, had them uh, hold a cell phone to their heart with the cell phone harmonizer in their hand as well, hold out their hand and push down on their hand without them knowing what we're doing. Their hand's very weak, goes right down. They smile. They don't know what you're doing. um, I'm sorry, uh, without the cell phone harmonizer. Um, And then we give them the cell phone harmonizer and they hold that with the phone and we push down on their hand and it's very strong. So the... the, uh, um, the absence of the cell phone harmonizer um, indicates uh, the body has this indicator, involuntary indicator, if you will, although you can, you know, fight it if you know what you're doing and you're trying to like strong arm, you can do some of that sometimes. Um, but it uh, indicates, you know, what is good for your body and what is not. So that's, you know, one, you know, method that we've used for testing. We've also tested it with um, uh, um, hypersensitive uh, EMF um, individuals that can't even use a phone, they can't use their laptop computer. And, uh, um, and now they can because of the technologies um, that we offered them. And, uh, you know, we have a, a, I think it's a 22 minute or 20 minute um, uh, video on our website um, on the EMF technologies. And uh, at the end, there's a, a, a woman um, from Vermont that um, did a testimonial on uh, her getting a cell phone harmonizer and how it impacted her life. And I filmed her live, you know, at, uh, um, and a, after um, I, I did a, a meditation um, up in uh, uh, Vermont and she had gotten one of our cell phone harmonizers, you know, weeks before a friend had actually given it to her. And she was, she was like, well, what is this thing going to actually do? And she noticed um, she, she actually got it uh, on a Saturday and on Monday she called me up you know, personally, and just said, you know, what's in this thing, because I can actually use my phone. And normally, my head hurts for hours after a a five minute phone call. Um, So we've done that. And with some of our other technologies, we've done, you know, other testing as well, and uh, GDV testing and HRV testing and stuff like that. But, um, you know, a lot of it's testimonials. And, you know, people, um, especially that are energy sensitive can feel the uh, the difference. Um, I actually met someone today at my wife's center, who was, um, uh, purchasing one of our Vogel cut crystals. And, um, and she, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, brought in her tester and actually she was testing one thing and we actually, I set the, uh, the cell phone down cause she had this special mineral that she brought, uh, to give us as a gift, which was super sweet. And, um, she had this special biogeometry, uh, pendulum, uh, which um, I think she said um, use, operates off of VG3 energy. And she held it and, and she didn't realize she had my phone facing up. And so she didn't realize I had anything on, on my phone. And she held it up and she said, look at this, look at what your phone's going to do. And then I'm going to place this rock that I'm giving uh, to you 
on it. And her pendulum started um, rotating uh, um, clockwise around the phone. And she goes, she t- picks it up and, and she brings it closer to her. And, uh, and then my wife said, um, oh, well, he has a cell phone harmonizer on the back of the phone. And I said, oh, here, I'll pop my phone out of the case. So I pop it out and she holds up the pendulum and it does a left-handed uh, spin. Um, then she takes her rock that she brought, set it on the phone, and it starts to do the right-handed spin. And it was a special rock. I forget the name of it. Um, I'll have to look it up. She just gave it to us. Um, but uh, it was really interesting because she didn't know that the cell phone was on and her, her, you know, her pendulum was going right. And she's like, huh. You know, she pulls it closer, you know, to, you know. Uh, like she was confused. You know, it, she was confused yeah. why it was going the, the quote unquote yeah. wrong and, direction. And, 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 which was really cool because I love those kind of things that happen when um, – your human thoughts not on it because you know when your human thought is on something you can actually influence the results of what you're looking for and that's why you know it's really hard you know um for you know um some things to be tested because you know people want and and the more conscious we become the more powerful manifestors we become so if we really want to influence something you can you know and you know it's like dousing you know the um, uh, w- with a pendulum where you hold up a, a pendulum and ask questions. If you really are trying to influence it, you're not going to get accurate results. So you have to really divorce yourself from the answer and the outcome and just say, okay, you know, what is the correct answer here? You know, I'm not going to have energy about it. And if you're able to go in with a clear mindset like that, you're going to get much more accurate uh, answers than if you go in with an agenda like, oh, I, you know, I want it to be a certain way because then you can influence it. Yeah. And you're kind of touching on what my next question would be, which is, you know, one, how much of the placebo effect kind of goes into this. And then number two, what you're even talking about from a quantum physics perspective of, you know, being the observer or the observer effect, I guess, which is essentially the same thing. So, you know, the placebo effect and the observer effect, is there a way that you've been able to negate those in your testing to know that, oh, this is actually a physical force of nature that we are, let's say, altering the spin. But it, I mean, it even sounds like your story kind of alludes to it, you know, being, being just that. Yeah. You know, I mean, um, <laughs> even though the, uh, medical, um, you know, establishment, they absolutely hate the placebo effect, right? Um, uh, it's, it's an amazing phenomena when you really think about it because it shows how powerful the human mind is you know, and that's, you know, something they wish they could just sweep under the table and get, <laughs> you know, get rid of. But, you know, um, there's been lots of studies, you know, done with sugar pills where they give, you know, uh, you know, someone a sugar pill and they get better or they do sham surgery where they just make an in- incision in someone's knee and they actually don't operate, stitch it back up and the person's knee is fine now all of a sudden. Right. Um And so, uh, yeah, you know, I don't think there is a way, you know, uh, to, um, uh, you know, to not get human consciousness involved in, in the creation, you know, process. And I think that's why we are all here is we are all creators, you know, and part of creation, um, you know, a part of the universe. And, um, so it is hard, you know, um, but, you know, I think, you know, if we go in with pure intent, you know, and, um, and your focus is on doing good and love, you know, those energies will flow into whatever you're trying to create, you know, whatever you're trying to do. And there's a vibe that goes out, you know, that can be felt. Um, and it's a genuine vibe and it, and it actually transmutes and changes, um, you know, that which is, you know, considered, uh, you know, uh, dysfunctional. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, we try our best, you know, through our testing, you know, we've probably spent, you know, 10 grand on, on, on testing different products. And then, you know, for the most part, what we've found is it's word of mouth. People have experiences. People come to my wife's center. They experience the quantum flow unit and the core harmonizer and, and our cohere meditation mat. They have an experience and then they go share that experience uh, with their friends and they're going to be the most believable ones because data can be manipulated. You can hand pick it. You can, you know, choose what you want. It's done all the time by, you know, uh, you know, I'm sure the pharmaceutical company is on what, what they would like, you know? Um, so, um, and, and even unintentionally, because we talked about, you know, the placebo effect too. I mean, they're, they're also going in with their intent. We want this, you know, to work. And, um, and so they're all also influencing, you know, 
um, intentionally and unintentionally, you know, the data that they're going to get. So I, I, you can't leave consciousness out of it. Um, and, and I think that's beautiful too, because it really shows, you know, how powerful we all are. Um, it's pretty crazy. And so it sounds like then you guys don't do a whole lot of marketing. Like it's just because if, you know, first of all, if this is as powerful as what we're describing it to be, you know, it's something that should probably be installed in every single house in the world. Anyone who has technology of any sort, any sort of Wi-Fi signal, any sort of phone or laptop, you should have, you know, all these devices. So like, what's your perception on that? Because you just see it as something that will make its way into the, let's say mainstream over time. Like you're just not too worried about, I guess, you know, I mean, you start a business, you want to make money, but like, are are you kind of just rolling with the flow of it of just like, you know, we're good monetarily and we just want people to recommend it. And as it gets out there, it'll get out there. Somebody will bring me on their podcast when it's time to talk about it. (laughs) (laughs) Like what's your, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, you know, I think um, I look at these all as tools because my father used to say that the most amazing piece of technology actually exists within each one of us. And so when we come, you know, when we incarnate on this planet, you know, um, you know, we, we sort of check our memory at the door and we don't realize how amazing we are. And one of my friends says, you know, only a master can hide the truth from themselves and then try to find it. And so that's sort of, you know, um, where we are. So we're starting off, you know, um, where we feel separate and alone and um, like everything is, um, uh, you know, imposing itself on us. You know, the radiation, you know, the um, stuff that they drop off in the sky, you know, um, the stuff they put in our food and so forth. And it uh, can be very dismal to live our lives feeling like, you know, we're just the byproduct of really incoherent, you know, people, you know, um, that are in um, production mode, you know, uh, affecting our reality and our environment. Um, So these technologies that we create, I look at as uh, helpful tools in that um, as we raise our consciousness and awareness, you know, hopefully we'll, we will not even need them. You know, that's, that's really where we'd like to go is where you don't even need that, you know, because you're creating your own experience and you're creating it by being the, the, um, uh, the thermostat. So when you walk into a room, don't be the thermometer. You want to be the thermostat and set Mm. that tone. And so, um, so these technologies, um, I find extremely helpful for like the cell phone thing, uh, you know, cell phone harmonizer, like when I'm using it, it, it no longer feels like someone's annoyingly tapping me on the shoulder. Cause when I don't have it, you know, on me, you know, I find that there's this slight irritation, you know, that I'm experiencing. Um, but when I have it on, it just, which it's permanently on. Um, but, uh, it feels like no one's bothering you. So, um, it feels like with all these, uh, frequencies and signals that people are putting out, you know, some, a lot of people, you know, uh, with great intentions, you know, the, um, creating the, uh, the internet, you know, and, and, uh, um, you know, internet of things and so forth, but it's almost like someone's imposing on you slightly. And at first you just feel a slight tap on the shoulder and, you know, after some amount of time, you just get used to it and you accept it. You don't even feel it, but then there's more that comes out and it's more tapping, more tapping, more irritants, and we can't quite place our finger on it. But if you can turn off that noise, like our, our whole house EMF, uh, technology, Um, when we um, put that into, you know, people's houses, sometimes, you know, uh, we did one down in North Carolina. Um, uh, Someone uh, had bought a number of our technologies. So we went down there because they bought our our big um, quantum flow unit and um, which uh, takes a couple of days to install. And when we went down there, they, they had also bought the whole house EMF technology. When we put it in um, their house and we turned it on, it was just like this subtle quietness where you couldn't really describe it. You know, it must have been like what it was to be around without cell phones, you know, which most of us forget, <laughs> you know, or, or, um, where, you know, I've uh, never experienced it. Yeah. I have no like. Yeah. It's just this, this slight quietness. It feels like it felt to me like, um, uh, it feels to me like, it's almost like you're in a forest and there's just this stillness, you know, just this quietness, you know, just takes the edge off of things. And it just feels really great. 
Um, so to be able to um, have these tools, these technologies create coherence in your environment so that you can more clearly, you know, um, download, receive information, you know, self-heal, um, you know, be at a greater sen- uh, state of being and peace. You know, I think there's uh, tremendous, you know, value in that, you know, experience. Um, uh, so do you feel like, and this is really interesting, where there might be a catch-22 here of, okay, if I, you know, get this EMF home harmonizer, let's say I even put it right beside me because there's a shit ton of EMF going off around me. <laughs> <laughs> but if I get it, I set it up, right? And then I'm able to, you know, feel this peace, this level of peace that you're describing, which I can imagine, but I can't really, you know, feel it, feel it. If I find that inner peace, then because of this, you know, this infinite being that I am, would I be able to reproduce that on a more, you know, let's say grand scale where now I might not even need the harmonizer anymore? Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I'll step back just for a minute before answering the full, you know, question here. You know, one thing that we have found, you know, on some rarer cases is that people are so used to that tapping and that noise that when they are in silence, it almost feels uh, annoying or um, different. And so they, that they judge that as, you know, oh, something's not right because they're used to so much incoherence you know, that it can feel like slightly um, annoying because it's just like, it it must um, be similar to like someone that's in New York City and is hearing honking and traffic all day long. They move out to the country where there's peace and they're like, oh, I can't do this. You know, it's too much. But then after they're in the country for the while, they're like, I love this sense of peace, you know, just feels so good. So, um, so there is that aspect that some people experience. Other people just that, you know, um, say, you know, I feel better knowing that I have this, you know, um, other people can tap in and they can, you know, feel the energies and, and the coherence and harmony. Um, uh, but to get to your question, uh, yes, you know, I mean, that's the absolute goal is, um, you know, when someone goes through our, uh, quantum flow unit, um, which I have a picture here just cause it's sort of hard to describe it. Um, but it looks like a, a, a giant, uh, bed, if you will. Um, with uh, two projectors and um, when some and you're surrounded by uh, nested geometries and uh, light and music um, you're not physical light that you can see but we're taking the information from light and putting it into this environment and you sleep um, in this thing right it's like a bed uh, with it's like a bed with an it, x-ray thing above you essentially <laughs> but not yeah, an x-ray. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah this this one um, you're in for like 30 to 40 minute sessions okay yeah, just a just a session and um, we're, we're not actually um, uh, projecting anything other than uh, light, the information from light, uh, music and geometry into the environment. But um, uh, some of it's going through a glass fiber to ensure that there's nothing else that's you know, flowing through, no electromagnetic frequencies or anything. It's just light, um, the information from light, music and geometries. And we can even turn the music off if you don't want to hear it, but you're still getting the information, ge- geometric inputs. Um, into that environment, but most people enjoy listening to music. Um, But when you're in there, what happens is when you surround yourself in a very coherent, harmonious environment, uh, you start to entrain with that and you start to jettison, you know, um, the baggage that we've all accumulated through the process of living. Um, So yes, you are absolutely right. When you're, when you're in a coherent environment, you know, and when you're around harmony, you will start to become that um, and start to jettison things that don't belong. Um, so, you know, that, and that's the goal. Like when people go out in nature, they just, and you sit under a tree and you're not on your cell phone and you're barefoot, you just start to feel better. You start to connect with, um, this coherent information field. Nature is a coherent information field, um, that nature is offering up through its, um, you know, uh, geometries, um, in the, the leaves, the bark, the cells, um, you know, the, all the earth inputs, the, um, microbial, uh, um, you know, uh, growth throughout all the soil that's interconnecting all life on the planet together, um, in this beautiful symbiotic way. Um, so yeah, that is definitely the goal, you know, is to get people to, uh, remember, you know, who they truly are on a, uh, you know, spiritual, you know, uh, connected plane and how we are all interconnected. And that's why, you know, especially at this time, you know, 
um, I know I've talked, you know, with uh, a lot of people about this, um, that um, the the time in which manifestation um, and um, and thought is really um, becoming more and more aligned and and uh, the, the time gap is closing where if you have a negative thought, someone's going to be honking at you, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, a couple minutes later, you're in your, your car, and all of a sudden, you have a negative thought about something. Um, you know, someone's honking at you, you have a positive thought about like, wow, wouldn't this be great. And then you're driving down the road, and someone's giving it away for free, or, you know, or there's, you know, there, there's uh, an, it's an, more a, instantaneous. A, a, yeah, more instantaneous. Um, you know, it's just beautiful to see and, and really celebrate that. And also claim too, because a lot of people are like, oh, geez, I have so many negative thoughts, you know, and we all do. I, I do, too. And um, it is to proclaim to yourself that a negative thought doesn't carry with it much strength and a positive thought is many multiple you know, times more powerful. So state that to yourself is really important. So then when those negative thoughts come in you can sort of breathe and like, oh, it's going to be all okay. And, and then try to, um, uh, focus on, you know, positivity and you know, what state of being you are and what you've been thinking about, um, based on how you're feeling. If you're feeling good, inspired, you know, relaxed, you know, then your chances are you're thinking of great things. And if you're feeling tense and angry and frustrated, then you've had, a, you know, some thoughts that aren't so supportive. Um, yeah. I'm, totally on board there. And it's pretty fascinating how, you know, you, what I'm thinking of is how, if you play the what if game, like what if everything goes wrong situation, which I think a lot of people are guilty of. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing how few of those or literally almost none of them ever even come true. It might be like two, five, two to five percent of those come true in some sort of way. And it's not even going to be to the extent that which you were thinking and which mm -hmm. goes to your point. You can play it with your own life. Like, Think about, you know, the worst th case scenario of the things that you've been thinking of. And it's like none of those have even occurred yet. We still mm -hmm. <laughs> have this propensity to think in terms of, well, what if this? What if that? What if I don't have enough? What if I'm in lack? And it's like it, it almost never comes to the extent that we think it coming to in those regards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. You know, I think that's uh, um, beautifully stated and said, you know, I think um a lot of these, uh, you know, our, our fears, you know, are, you know, they don't come true. You know, it's just, um, it's, it's, they're, they're basically different, um, perspectives being offered up. And if you really focus, pour your, uh, amazing, uh, manifestation ability to and creative power, which we all have to it, you can manifest them, you know, um, there's, you know, uh, horrors going on, you know, in the world all over. And you can experience those if you want to. You can be a part of them. You can make them real, you know, uh, really part of your life um, if you want. Um, or you can, you know, uh, um, detach from them and, and send love and light. And you sending that love and light and coherence is actually part of the solution for whatever, whatever uh, others are experiencing, you know, that would not be deemed as something favorable at all. And so a lot of people feel like somehow they have to feel bad and somehow feeling bad or guilty somehow makes some kind of a difference. It doesn't, it's the same frequency band, unfortunately, you know, I, I used to do that, you know, too. And, um, but if you focus on, you know, love, you know, I saw a Facebook post the other day um, and, and it, someone said um, there was a, a, a picture of a family walking, all holding hands, you know, the mom, dad, and two kids. And uh, um, it said, if you want to change the world, start at home. You know, and uh, and that's so true, because a lot of times people are like so angry with what's going out, that, you know, on out there and feeling like they wish they could make a difference. Yet they're sort of doing the same thing at home. They aren't present for their kids. They're not, you know, loving. They aren't, you know, they aren't patient, you know, all that kind of stuff. And um, it really does start at home. And, you know, home is sort of the center. Right. And we all have different versions of home. And so, you know, we just have to make the best of whatever version we have is. And, and maybe you don't have a home and that's OK, too. But there's there's um, examples of motherly and fatherly and brotherly and sisterly qualities all around us. You know, and I think that's one of the things that I learned, you know, the past few years, because, you know, I had um, uh, my my mom passed on unexpectedly like a, a, just a light switch, um, you know, flipped, um, when she was in Paris, France, uh, on a, an amazing trip with uh, my sister and her family. 
um, in, 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 in uh, the hotel room. Um, and, uh, um, and then, you know, and she was one of my best friends and we had this amazing connection. Uh, and then, uh, so that really shifted my whole life in terms of what, what, you know, direction and so forth. Cause I asked the big questions of like, gosh, if I left tomorrow, would I be happy with what I did? And the answer was absolutely not, you know? And so I was like, gosh, you better get on the right train. <laughs> you know, you better start, you know, making uh, decisions and, and living the life you really want to live. You know, and then my dad, he uh, he left um, the planet about three years ago and he was another one of my best friends. We worked together all the time and same thing, bam, like that, you know, in a shop. And, you know, I, I really feel like both of them were called, um, you know, to do other work because um, they were both healthy people. They were both beautiful people. Um, and uh, uh, but it, but after that happened, um, you know, I had this sort of hollowness of like, you know, well, geez, you know, I, I don't have a mom and dad, but there are motherly qualities, you know, in people all around, you know, so I could feel that, you know, there's fatherly qualities. And it's like, my family really feels like it continues to grow rather than shrink. I love and that. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm so grateful for that. Um, you know, so um, no matter where we are in our lives, you know, what we're seeking exists, and it exists all around us. And we just have to be open to it you know, and just, you know, be a part of it. And so, um, you know, when people are feeling down and they're feeling alone, you know, there's other people like that around you, you know, that, you know, need to feel that sense of love. And it's like, when you meet someone with love, you know, even if they're expressing anger, they'll either be transformed or they'll be transferred. And, you know, it's like a light switch. And, um, I heard a testimonial, of, uh, of this, um, this woman, um, I'll share, uh, w with you. That was, uh, really interesting. This, this, uh, um, I had gone to listen to a lecture many, many years ago and this lady was from, uh, down South and she, uh, um, had been reading about, um, love and kindness and joy and that that's what we should be expressing. And, um, uh, this was a sort of a new train of thought for her. And she, um, uh, was a, um, a African-American woman. Um, and, uh, um, she was, uh, you know, had, had experienced, you know, racial, you know, uh, you know, horrors of her, her time. And, uh, she, she was, she was parked somewhere and she was coming out of this building and she was going to her car and this guy was trying to park. And I guess her car, you know, was somewhat in his spot that he wanted to park in. And he looks at her and he goes, is this your wreck? And, uh, um, and she looked at him and then all of a sudden he started using racial slurs and all this other kind of stuff. And she looked at him and she just thought to herself, gosh, all this stuff that I've been reading about it, expressing love, you know, joy, kindness, maybe this is when I use it. Right. You know, mm -hmm, yeah. here's someone really asking, you know, for they're demonstrating they're lacking something in their life. Right. But it's easy to then throw that negativity back. So it was really cute and funny. She said, uh, she said, I sized them up and realized if it didn't work, I could take them. <laughs> <laughs> and so she goes over um, and she said, I am so sorry. And she just, you know, spoke, you know, thoughts of kindness towards him and his contorted face uncontorted. And he looked at her and he just started to weep. And, um, he was totally transformed and he started to apologize. And there was just this huge healing between, you know, these two people, you know, that had come from, you know, two different areas and, you know, had, you know, two different upbringings. And, you know, here's, here was this release. And, you know, I did that with someone on the, uh, the phone the other day, they, they had called up and, um, uh, something had happened and they, they felt like it was, um, it was not a good thing and that I wouldn't be happy or something. And I just said, it's all okay. You know, I love you. It's just a learning experience. And the person, uh, you know, uh, emotionally released on the phone and just, you know, thanked me and, and then hung up. And it's just like, it's, it's really that simple being kind, being loving, you know, it feels, you know, it can feel so foreign, but when we, when we express that, it's like, it is the strongest, uh, you know, force in the, in the universe. Um, it really is. It, it provides the protection, you know, um, that we need. It provides the knowledge and understanding the healing potentials. You know, there's an answer to every single problem. It exists. There's an answer and it's just which frequency band are we on? I am right there with you. It's reminding me of a picture that I've seen online a couple times where it, it's like 
it might be three or four pictures in a row, but the first picture is of a guy and he's like super angry. And then the next picture, it kind of shows like a layer of his face is removed and under it is a face that's crying. And then in the mm-hmm. next picture, that face layer is removed. And then you see a, a like a little boy kind of like curled up in a corner of like a wall. And the whole thing is, is exactly is like, you know, we're all at some level just a kid. And the reason people get angry, the reason that, you know, you see all of this, let's say hatred is they're, they were a kid at one point that never understood their ability to express their emotions. They were never shown love, maybe from their parents. They were in a place of fear or shame or guilt and they're crying. They're literally crying on the inside and their only way to express that is anger because that's probably what they were taught from their parents. And so when you sit there and spread that love, you spread that, listen, like it's all going to be okay energy. They Mm -hmm. have no choice to continue to be angry. Like it's not, they're either going to leave because they don't know how to confront it or they're going to, like you said, just emotionally break down and, you know, it's going to heal you and them at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's so powerful. Yeah. You're so right. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, we all have a child inside. I think one of the 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 biggest things that I learned when I grew up was um, when we're little, we think that all adults get it, right? We think like there's this authoritative right. figure, you know, that listen to them, they get it, and they have all the worldly experience. Then you become an adult and you realize they're just we're all just bigger kids, you know. We're all just bigger kids, you know. There's a and Rick it's and all Morty, okay. There's a Rick and Morty quote. It's like we're just kids having kids. And yeah. <laughs> that really hit the order I get, yeah. the more that hits home, I'm like, shit. Like <laughs> and now like looking at my life doing introspection and looking at my parents, I'm like, shit, I got that from you. Like I thought you had this figured out. <laughs> like I came into this world thinking you had it figured out. And now I'm realizing that all this shit is just a rep- repercussion or a repetition of what you did that I learned from. And I'm like, shit. <laughs> all right. So I like, do I even have it figured out? <laughs> like it's really interesting from those that uh from those regards, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, the only difference that I, that I see and have found is that, um, the adult kids, uh, aren't as open-minded, uh, you know, as the, they as the youthful kids, a little bit more. Cemented. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's a great, a great word to, um, describe it. You know, I think, um, <clears throat> if we can, if we can be our big kid, but then have the exploratory mind of a little child and openness, not feeling like we get it all and we have all the answers and what we were taught was correct. And we defend, you know, that truth or what we feel is that truth. Because as, you know, as I continue to grow, I notice that some of the laws of the universe um, that we were taught are so real and so um, set in stone. It's very, it, it's not like that. It's, it, it, um, I think it's as we start to raise our awareness, we realize that um, things become more fluid and it's not like, that's not really always the case, you know? Um, You know, there's exceptions, you know, with, with matter, you know, too, and physicality. And, um, and, you know, I've really used that a lot throughout my own life, you know, and found that it was hugely instrumental for, for healing. You know, when you encounter um, something physical, you know, you, um, some kind of injury that you experience, it feels like you're at a crossroad um, and you can either turn left or right. You know, let's say left is, you know, you're going to experience the pain, the suffering, the damage, you know, right um, is you switch to a reality where that didn't happen to that extent or as severe, or maybe it didn't even happen at all, you know? And, and I think that's the key to instantaneous healings, you know, um, which when, you know, they seem like very rare experiences, but when, when we are unwilling to accept, uh, uh, the, um, incoherent reality of our situation, um, and deny it, um, you know, uh, we can actually shift to a different reality. And I've seen that happen. You know, I've had, you know, a number of those experiences myself, you know, um, you, you tend to really see it with small children, little kids. And, and, um, if you see a two-year-old running through the house and they trip on, you know, a dog toy and hit their head on the side of the door frame, 
a lot of times the first thing that the little kid will do is they'll turn and they'll look at mom. If mom's not there, they'll look at dad. How is mom, you know, reacting to this situation? If mom is like, oh, you dear little child, you know, and runs over, oh my gosh, that might, that must have hurt. Oh my gosh, let's rub it. Let's put ice on it. Let's, you know, look at it. You know, all the, let's all focus on it. Let's cry about it. That child will go through a, a, a much heavier degree of suffering than the mother that goes over and just as lovingly, you know, um, approaches the situation and arguably more lovingly because of the mother's awareness, but um, uh, uh, just as lovingly goes over, picks up that dear child and said and tries to redirect that experience and says like, oh, here, come over here, check out this toy. And, you know, maybe just gives the gentle pat on the head or something like that. Just as much love, you know, but a different way of understanding, you know, the situation. And um, uh, I uh, shared this the other day with someone, um, I think it was two years ago, um, we live on a little pond and uh, um, we had gotten our, our um, at the time, I guess he was uh, six years old, um, our son, a kayak, um, just this little hundred dollar kayak and um, uh, to sit on top one and my wife and I kayak and and he and I were swimming, you know, in this, um, in this pond. Um, and, uh, we were both sitting on the kayak and his kayak is very small. Um, so my weight is sinking this thing down, you know, it's, it's super small. And, um, and I slid off the back <clears throat> and somehow he slid off the kayak, um, shot up in the water, you know, um, and slammed down on his head and he was under the boat. I quickly popped out, you know, um, and, you know, removed the, uh, the kayak, you know, got him. And, uh, um, he looked at me, there was a couple tears. My wife was very, you know, she was a little concerned, um, you know, at the, at uh, the time, you know, of the, the, you know, how big was the bump, you know, that was, she could really hear, you know, the whole, you know, hit his head. And I just said to her, I said, it's all okay. You know, let's just let this go. And I took him up. I redirected the energy. <clears throat> he didn't, uh, he wasn't instilled with a sense of fear for swimming. You know, um, he was a new swimmer. Um, he didn't have, you know, a fear of kayaking after that. Um, there were very few tears shed. He was back in the water swimming with me a few minutes later. It was all beautiful and it was all okay. And, you know, my wife was very grateful for, um, you know, seeing this in action because when these things happen, it's easier on paper to say, oh, this is what I would do. But then you see it and it looks so real. <laughs> it feels so personal. And one of the other things that I had to do, which was a big one, was forgive myself. I had to forgive myself right then and there, because if I didn't, I was holding to a reality in which I injured my son. And so it, it, it's um, some people say, well, isn't that just denying, you know, something, you know, it, it isn't it's denying a reality that I would want for my son that wouldn't be harmonious. And and my love for my son, just like the love for um, the creator uh, towards each one of us is so strong that we want to dismiss anything, you know, that would try to color the situation negatively. Well, then and, um, you feel, you'd feel guilty too. And then you're now acting towards your son with the energy of guilt, which is a much lower vibration than love. And he's going to mm. feel that. So now you're, you, you know what I mean? Like if you feel guilty that you did this to your son, you're going to be like, I, I don't know exactly how that would manifest, but you'd be acting through the energy of guilt. You're no longer going to be in this compassion or love or, you know, let me support my son in the best way I can because you're now acting from that lower vibration of shame or guilt. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Clayton. That's uh, <laughs> that's exactly right. We can either be in which frequency band do we want to be in? It's hard to be in multiple at the same time, you know. So we can either be in the frequency of guilt, you know, um, uh, the frequency of anger towards ourselves, you know, uh, you know, hitting ourselves. Gosh, you know what a, a you know a bad dad I've been. You know, I should have been more careful. You know, all those negative thoughts that try to enter in. You know, or we can push that aside and and have this true compassion for the situation and also redirect, you know, that energy, you know, that is trying to present itself. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's uh, it's an opportunity, really a challenge, you know, but an opportunity. And the more we do it, you know, a lot of times people around you think like you're um, not compassionate, you know, it's like, oh, gosh, you know, what, why wouldn't you just feel horrible about that? You know, this just happened. And you, you know, somehow made a mistake. And, you know, but it's like, you can't live in that energy band. Um, 
you know, it, it, it's it, and even there's more no so, healing that happens. Exactly. Yeah. And even more so, the question becomes, how does me feeling bad for it help the situation? Like, <laughs> the, you're saying that if I feel bad, then it then it makes me a better parent. <laughs> like, I, I don't have kids. Yeah. But to me, that doesn't that just doesn't jive. And what this is reminding me of, I, I've talked about this on podcast episodes before, is the idea of um, I, I came to this the first time I was exposed to it with. Uh, people who like walk on coals or like walk on really hot coals. Yeah, yeah. It's like they get into the super meditative state. I'm assuming now looking back on it, probably from like the energy frequency of love and light and they'll walk across these coals and get to the other side unhithered. There will be no burns on them, all this stuff. And <laughs> for the longest time that perplexed me, especially coming from an engineering background, I'm like, all right, this doesn't make sense. Like what type of voodoo witchcraft are they doing here? <laughs> Well, you know, through this whole spiritual enlightenment thing, I'm now at this point of just letting that energy flow through you, especially if it's some negative energy that's like guilt or shame. It's like, just let that flow through you. You don't need to attach to it. And the, this is illustrated physically through if you ever get burned or if you ever burn yourself or get hit in the head with a kayak, <laughs> <laughs> just let that energy flow through you. Because what I've noticed is, is that when you hold on to it and try to resist it, that's whenever you're going to get the scolding welt on your hand. This is when you're going to get a huge bump on your head. This is when, you know, maybe there would be head trauma in those cases. But if you hold it in this like, okay, just feel that energy, let it flow through you. And then you're, you're fine seconds later because you're not impeding the, mov the movement of energy. You're letting it just flow through you. Yeah, no, that's beautifully said. Absolutely. You're right on. And, okay. And so now that we're getting back to the engineering stuff, <laughs> um, I'm interested to hear about your past. Like I, I want to hear, uh, and I'm not sure which way to phrase this because I'm curious if there's an engineering background to you or if you kind of just got all this information from the uh, astral realm. So I, I'd love if you could kind of touch on your background in engineering or if all this information was just downloads from the astral plane. Yeah. So, um, my father was a materials engineer and, uh, amazing scientist. You know, he, he had, uh, um, started a big company where he made reinforced ceramics, uh, jet engine components, um, uh, um, rotors for your car that would outlast the life of your entire car that you would never have to, um, replace, um, armor for, uh, um, uh, personnel carriers that could take, um, you know, 50 caliber uh, machine gun bullets, multiple hits in the same little thin tile. Um, just absolutely amazing um, stuff. And he grew this company from, we, we were homeless at the time, uh, not out on the streets, but um, didn't have a home. And uh, um, so went from uh, being homeless um, when I was really little to, you know, a couple of years later um, uh, uh, for him starting this technology company, which ultimately had four or 500 employees in it. And, um, uh, along that path, um, my brother, um, younger brother passed on, which is a total setback and shock for the family. Um, you know, good friend of mine, you know, um, new member, you know, he's only four, um, uh, wow. of the family. And that was quite a shock. And so after that, um, it sort of switched courses and it ended up being, um, you know, in a roundabout way, a gift and a blessing, you know, from my brother to inspire us to um, ultimately go on a different path. And uh, um, so uh, in middle school, my parents decided to sell their house that they had bought and buy this little, um, you know, hobby farm uh, that was just a few miles away. And so we moved into that and um, we got uh, emus and South American ostriches and horses. And um, we were taught about hard work and, you know, farm life and, um, and so forth. And, uh, and my dad, meanwhile, was running this high tech company. Um, but in all that, um, probably the biggest, um, transformational blessing, um, for me was my dad got a, um, uh, took our two car garage and made it into a machine shop. And he taught me how to weld and to, uh, um, use some woodworking tools and, um, lathes and milling machines and so forth. And so out of that, that's when my creative juices started to flow. Um, and I um, started to get ideas for products and, um, and things that I wanted to make and, uh, <clears throat> um, 
And so I would make them in, in the shop. And it was how, funny. How old my, would you have been at this time? Um, I was uh, um, in, uh, I guess I was in like sixth, seventh grade, somewhere around there. Yeah, right. so pretty, you know, pretty young. And, um, and, and, uh, my, uh, um, it was funny cause my mom and dad or my mom and sister would go out shopping and my dad and I would go shopping as well, but we, we would go in our, our physical shop, you know, where we were making stuff. Uh, okay. That was the air quotes. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, uh, um, so anyways, um, uh, out of that, you know, I started to design stuff. I designed a, a really cool sled for sledding down uh, a hill, a runner sled. But I used tubular runners um, made out of uh, metal steel conduit that you see in like um, people run wires in in basements for their electrical. Um, so I <clears throat> I bent that and welded brackets, you know, with my dad's help at the time um, uh, onto them and, and created this really cool sled. I called it the the dragon and um it was actually um you know wood top sled with metal runners and um sort of like the traditional sleds except that the runners were tubular and the second most important thing was um the front end uh was detached from the back end um and so it was like a third of the sled was up front connected to the uh two-thirds of the sled by a hinge with one pin and um so that the the it would allow the uh, sled to turn side to side and go up and down, and um, uh, allow tremendous flexibility and mobility, and which was really cool because when you're sledding down a hill with your friends, you could actually do a 360, you know, in the right conditions, and it, it was just oh, so, so much cool. fun. So yeah, so after that, I was just like, oh, what else can I make? <clears throat> so then I made a uh, homemade snowmobile slash go kart creation. Oh, yeah, there you go, <laughs> and. Uh, yeah. And, uh, some other things. Um, well, no. and then, so how did you get yeah. this, how did you get this knowledge? I mean, you know, if you're a, what would you have yeah. been 11, 12, somewhere in that range, where, where's the knowledge coming from? Like your dad showed you how to weld, your dad showed you how to put certain pieces together. Um, I, I don't want to date you. I'm not sure how old you are, but I, I'm assuming the internet wouldn't have been as vast as it is now. Were you Get, do you feel like this was like your first touch with the astral realm? Like, like where were these ideas kind of coming from? Yeah. You know, um, <clears throat> the ideas were, uh, uh, my, my, uh, my grandfather was a, uh, inventor, um, you know, as well. And then my dad, you know, uh, he was on 900 foreign patents and a hundred U S patents wow. and the way, yeah. And the, uh, the way that he would, um, uh, create, and this is, I, I thought this was somewhat normal, you know, growing up when you see this just happening is my dad would keep a uh, pad of paper by his side of the bed and he would wake up in the morning or, you know, in the middle of the night rather, and just start jotting down notes for ideas and inventions and, oh, and wow. new products and so forth, and then fall back asleep. And sometimes like, um, he was up many times throughout the night. It was a little hard on my mom sleeping, you know, because she would see the light go on and notes come in. And sometimes he would go down to the kitchen and, you know, continue to write and then go back to bed and so forth. Um, and so I started doing a little of that, um, you know, and uh, but a lot of um, that started when I just, you know, realized, you know, how we could um, how easy it was to create because I was around my father who is an example of that. And, you know, as a kid, you just start to, you know, more entrain with your parents a lot of times, um, you know, in terms of what they do and, you know, uh, how they act and so forth. And um, and I started doing more and more of that myself. And my dad talked to me about his inventing process and what he would go through and um, which only improved over time to the point where in the last <clears throat> 20 years of his life or so, um, he was able to uh, um, just receive ideas in their completeness um, without any research and development, without any trial and error, um, and uh, really shortcut the uh, the process to creation where um, normally it would take years to create, you know, you know, something. And now you could create it in, you know, months, you know, weeks, you know, uh, um, you know, a year or something like that, depending on what you were creating. Um, and most of that was just um, the time it took to actually physically, you know, uh, um, machine or whatever the the, the parts. The physical and, item. Yeah, exactly. So, as exactly. A, so as a quick note, just for anyone listening, 
uh, the astral realm is essentially anything from astral projection to lucid dreaming to like the dream state in general. So just, I just want to make that note because I, that's why I was super fascinated when you're saying that your dad would come out of, he would wake up, come out of the dream and then mm-hmm. have these essentially these downloads because I mean, that's where, when we talk about the astral realm and I just want to make this note for anyone listening that that is where kind of these things happen. And and maybe this is kind of where you're about to go with it, but I'm interested how your father would have received those things. Like, was this something that he was conscious of receiving? Is it something that he, because I mean, my understanding is with like lucid dreaming, you're able to actually physically manipulate kind of the reality and landscape around you, but there isn't like physics to it. Now with astral projection, you do have the physical nature of it. Maybe I'm getting ahead of the question. <laughs> um, maybe I should take a step back here and just say, you know, was your dad conscious of these, of these downloads? Was he conscious of the astral realm? Was he conscious of it? Or was it just like these like little, like just light bulb moments? And he was like, Oh, this would work. Oh, this would work. Yeah, it, it definitely both. You know, sometimes, um, the way we create, um, would be, we would receive information, um, you know, on a, you know, technology or a product or something. And, but there would be elements of it missing, but then throughout the day it would pop in, like, even without thinking about it, like, this is what you need to do, you know, here, <clears throat> you need to have this, you know, specific part, it needs to rotate this way, or it needs to, you know, have this component to it. And um, being, you know, my dad was a materials engineer and worked in labs and, and, uh, you know, started mul- started multiple companies, you know, even when he was really young. Um, so he had the ability to um, translate uh, um, in the 3D world and and how to get some of the things that he was receiving, uh, you know, in downloads, you know, from a practical sense to be able to create it like, oh, this is what we sort of have in this three dimensional plane is we can use this to create that. Um, so you know, sometimes it was, uh, um, pictures and Im- images, you know, sometimes it was thoughts, you know, mostly he, re- he saw, you know, color images a lot of times of what he was looking to create. And, um, what's neat is when we start to, and this ability was actually within all, all of us, it's just, most of us aren't choosing to activate it. Um, but you can start to overlay on this reality. Like I can be talking to you and I can picture almost like a 3d model, of whatever I'm, you know, looking to create in front of me and talking to you, it's not as clear. And at least in my case, it's not as clear. And, um, and it's sort of like a, a rough form, if you will, but I can rotate it around in my mind's eye. Um, especially if I just like stop and, and meditate, you know, on it and just, you know, quiet my own thought and just become more of an observer. Um, you know, that's when, you know, the models and stuff can, you know, come more easily and readily. Um, you can have your eyes open, closed, um, doesn't matter. Um, and the information, the materials, what to make it out of, you know, will come. And sometimes it's as you're building it, sometimes it's in synchronicity, like, oh my gosh, I'm supposed to use acetal plate or nylon or aluminum or copper or whatever, you know, in this, you know, um, uh, in this manner. Um, and my dad, you know, would be like, oh, well, the reason why we had to use copper is because of the heat transfer of this or that or whatever. So he had the ability to translate like why the information was coming through in a certain way and make sense of it. Like that makes perfect sense when you look at it, you know, at this way. Um, so, um, you know, that's sort of how we create, you know, I started off by creating a company, um, that made Jeep and off-road accessories. Cause I had a Jeep Wrangler, you know, I love to off-road and, um, I just love the, uh, the idea of Jeeps and their freedom and so forth. Now I don't have a Jeep. Um, but, uh, um, so I, I would find issues with the Jeep Wrangler that I wished, you know, were different. And I'd be like, oh my gosh, I'll just create a product around that. And so we ended up create, I formed a company and, um, we created 49 different products for Jeep Wranglers <laughs> oh, wow. and we sold them to, yeah. And we sold them to, um, Quadratech and four wheel drive hardware, which were sort of like the, the JC Whitney's of the Jeep world catalogs. And there was around, I think it was close to a dozen catalogs carried our products and we would manufacture them and, and send them to them and sell them wholesale and retail and all that kind of stuff. And it was really neat. I, I remember creating a couple of products where the idea would come through 
And at the time, <clears throat> at this time, I was living in Western Massachusetts um, at this sort of um, really old, uh, but not as beautiful as you would think, uh, um, farmhouse that was sort of, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, structurally it had some issues. It ended up being um, uh, uh, plowed down years later. But, um, you know, it was a couple hundred year old farmhouse. And um, my company was in the upstairs of an uninsulated barn with this uh, wood stove that I had put in. So I would go out, you know, in the dead of winter and I could get the temperature up to like 45 to 50 degrees. And that's where I'd work all day long, you know, and there'd be mice running around and so forth. But um, uh, before I got my um, uh, business on Main Street, you know, downtown. Um, but uh, anyways, I, some, there was a couple of times where an idea would come for a new product and I'd be like, for a Jeep. And I'd be like, Oh my gosh, I got to make that. And I would go, I would make it, I would put it on the website. And in less, you know, than, you know, in some cases less than 10 hours, it went from idea form to physical form to actually on the website for sale. Jeez. And, uh, you know, and I would make the first one and it would, you know, if I got multiple orders, that's when I would get into trouble because I hadn't yet stocked out, <laughs> you know, insane. all the products, but I was a smaller, you know, operation. So it wasn't like, I had this flood of people that like you put something on and you'd sell a hundred things at once. It would you know, usually take time, but um, so it's not it, even, it was just such a fun process. It's yeah. not even like you were, were you even looking for these problems or you kind of just immersed yourself as this, you know, Jeep Wrangler owner and then <laughs> things just kind of came in. Is that essentially how it played out for you? <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the first product actually was um, we were living in Delaware at the time and it was for a hard top hoist to remove the uh, the top on the back of your Jeep. And I spent, you know, $100 on one of these um, systems and I bought it. I was all excited. It came with this like super thin rope, um, <clears throat> uh, not was it nylon? It was, um, oh, polyethylene or po polypropylene, I think it was, uh, rope that was super slippery. It had um, this tiny little... Um, I think it was a single pulley wheel at the top and you mounted it at one place, you know, in your garage. In our case, we um, mounted it in our barn. And as soon as, you know, my dad and I tugging on the super thin rope, you know, got that hard top, you know, airborne. Um, of course, it's heavier, you know, in the back than the front. It tipped. And then as soon as I drove the Jeep out from under, it just started spinning because it's picking up from one place. So I was like, this is just a ridiculous design. You know, so we redesigned it, you know, 12 pulley wheels. Um, you know, I had um, it picked up from two points, you know, and so forth. And so I ended up selling the first ones on eBay. They, you know, I got really good reviews. And then out of that, I started my own company. And that was one of the first products. And then we had electric versions of the Jeep hardtop hoist and hand crank ones um, and, and all sorts of things. But um, it was sort of out of a necessity of like, is this what, you know, is really available at this day and age to the Jeep community? Like, this is just a little crazy. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, some of them happen that way. So do you have any... I mean, it's fascinating. And honestly, I'm having like 30 questions flying through my head. So <laughs> I'm going to have to just try to pick them as they come. So was there, do you have any like engine, like per, like school engineering, like knowledge other than let's say high school, like what, like what, like from a traditional sense of schooling, what is your yeah, background? Yeah. So, um, I was very interested in design and stuff. Um, but I never took engineering, um, you know, in, in college or even in high school. Um, I was part of an engineering club in high school, which was just a little, little club that, you know, a, a dozen people were in and we did a few things, you know, which was fun. But um, aside from that, no, it was just all sort of like practically taught and self-taught. A lot of it, you know, was self-taught. You know, um, I learned a lot from my father. Um, and I had a mentor, um, that lived on an Island up in Maine that I would see, you know, um, a couple times a year that I would stay over and, and he would teach me, you know, what he had learned. Um, and, uh, but yeah, it was, it was, uh, I went to, uh, Penn state for, and majored in ag science and, um, uh, and so I got an agricultural degree and, um, and so, yeah, I don't have any engineering, uh, um, schooling you know, just, you know, practical experience, you know, um, uh, um, but yeah, no, it was, uh, it's interesting, you know, how that manifests. Obviously I wish, you know, nowadays that I had gone and gotten an engineering degree and all that kind of stuff, but it doesn't sound like you need I, it. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, it, it could have hindered me in other ways, you know, too. Um, because I, I, um, 
I started to realize, and my dad did as well, you know, that um, you start to realize, you start to work with um, higher dimensional physics, which is hard to explain, you know, um, uh, you know, in the, in this world. Um, so you're able to get results from things that would in some cases seem impossible and unlikely. And that's, you know, how my dad created his, you know, um, company years ago, um, you know, was, uh, which ultimately ended up going bankrupt, um, pretty much, you know, shut down because of, uh, some things in society where they weren't interested in, um, creating new materials. The CEOs decided like, let's focus on the shareholders, short-term profits and let's get rid of new, new, you know, new, um, technologies in, in our cars and in, uh, you know, the mining industry and so forth, because we can, we're not going to be here, you know, in a few years, we can make millions focusing on shareholders. Yep. Let's not focus on the company's growth. Let's just focus on ourselves. So that big mega trend that happened all over the world, you know, um, uh, really affected them. They sold off parts of their company and stuff, but it was a trying and hard time for, you know, my parents and, and my family where we went from, you know, um, you know, experiencing abundance to absolute, you know, losing, you know, almost everything. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was, it was sort of a dark time, but, um, it was also a blessing because it allowed us to, um, my dad, he spent probably five years studying and researching, um, uh, higher dimensional physics, um, you know, phenomena, um, and just was reading book after book and, um, many books at once. And he would have a, a book that had like, you know, 30 little, um, you know, post-it note flags, you know, in it, or, or maybe even a hundred. And, um, he, he was just absorbing all this information. And then one day he was like, we need to create some technologies. And out of that, we started to create these higher dimensional technologies to help facilitate, re-empowerment for people's consciousness and so it and it ended up being a blessing you know that you know we went through this step and you know there was the uh the the um you know that time where things sort of fell apart um but yeah so in that in that answer you mentioned higher dimensional physics higher dimensional items multiple times so i, I think this is something we got to touch on because <laughs> i know that it's it's one of those things that it's probably going to be difficult to talk about because it's like language. We're only able to talk about certain things because of the limitations of language. Like the way that we even express ourselves at higher levels is almost impossible. It's like, it's like dreaming, you know, they, it's a higher dimensional plane of existence of infinity that can only use the human experience to convey messages to each other. Right. Mm -hmm. So, how exactly, well, not exactly, but <laughs> how would you be able to interpret or how, how would you be able to break down high dimensional physics or high dimensional structures or mathematics on this three dimensional physical plane? Um, I think it goes back to uh, sort of information fields and information field technology. So historically there's been gravitational fields magnetic fields strong and weak uh, nuclear attraction fields um and uh um uh and and there's also um i'm forgetting one of them um but there's there's five fields of science and uh um uh there's also one called an information field and an information field is a uh, is a thought field basically and behind um, everything, if you could break it down, you know, people talk about energy, um, how everything is energy and so forth. But if, you know, what is energy? It's really uh, information being expressed in some form. So if you go beyond energy, you know, you find information and information is thoughts and ideas. Um, and so uh, going into higher dimensional physics is really activating uh our innate uh a, a brilliance you know um and interconnectivity you know that's in when, within each one of us and that's how the universe expresses itself in information and so um you you know uh you are what you think you know your your body is sort of a, a um in some cases a report card of your inner thoughts and inner experiences and if there's something that manifests that isn't you know pleasant you know, um, it's, it's really your higher self getting, getting 
um, you aware of something on another level um, that needs to be addressed. And I think that's why, you know, people that are um, using pharmaceuticals, they're, they're trying to, you know, to suppress symptoms. You're never getting to the root cause, you know, which is always mental. There's always something behind that root cause, you know. And, um, you know, there's, uh, there's something behind the deficiency or there's something behind the anxiety, you know, um, there's something behind the blisters or whatever someone's dealing with, you know, uh, and so, and we're all dealing with, you know, things I'm wearing glasses, you know, uh, um, you know, we're all, uh, you know, doing our best and, and, and working through things. But I think, um, uh, you know, if we can start to see things as information and go back into the operating system, so to speak, and correct or change um, or calibrate um, or adapt, you know, that information, um, you can get uh, different physical manifestations and outcomes. And so um, the more we, um, you know, went down this path, we realized that the human mind, you know, whatever you can, you know, perceive, you, you know, it can be created, you know, um, there can be reality if, if it's based in coherence and harmony, because, um, you know, I don't know if we want to go down this path, but, um, <laughs> uh, you know, love is truly the only force that there is, you know, I know everyone's like, oh, gosh, well, there's the devil, there's hate, you know, there's, um, and there is darkness to show us the contrast, and we need the darkness to show us the light. Um, uh, however, this, the, the darkness, um, uh, you know, the, you know, the things that we would perceive as negative anyways, um, uh, aren't always negative, you know, for, for example, sometimes it's our human mind, you know, um, translating things a certain way. And then we realize later on, like, oh, that was actually a positive thing. I deemed it as negative. And, um, and sometimes, you know, the negative is, uh, you know, just literally, you know, a, an opportunity, um, uh, a report card for us to realize that, you know, something else needs to transform or change in our lives. And so higher dimensional physics, sorry for taking so long to describe, it, but, but higher dimensional physics is really activating, um, uh, um, protocols that aren't normally in this three dimensional realm, uh, but do have, uh, the ability to manifest and, and create phenomenon, you know, in this realm. And so my dad, um, he <clears throat> traveled to Penn State a lot and, and he was invited to talk and, and see phenomenon. And <coughs> excuse me. Oh, good. And uh, he said um, <clears throat> one time he met this um, woman who was able to sprout um, a roasted peanut shell uh, in her hand. And um, wow. There was a bunch of scientists around and they, uh, <coughs> excuse me, tickle in my throat. Oh, yeah. Um, and, uh, they, um, <coughs> they weren't sure if it was a sleight of hand. So they actually, um, engraved uh, some kind of code on the, uh, um, roasted peanut and handed it to her and supplied it. Cause they weren't sure if somehow she was pulling one out of her pocket somehow or whatever. And, um, but she flew over, uh, um, from China and, um, she was reported to have these amazing abilities <clears throat> and uh sure enough she um held out her hand and and uh in a matter of moments opened it up and this roasted peanut which is roasted is clinically dead <laughs> right and uh um sprouted you know a, a few inch sprout um you know in her hand and so <clears throat> she was someone that um didn't have you know an engineering de degree didn't have she was a very simple person um, and came from, I think, a farming community, um, a rural farming community, and uh, had these amazing abilities. <clears throat> and she was able to tap into something, whether she was conscious about it or not, you know, she was able to, um, you know, uh, do this. And my dad, um, she had a translator there. And so he asked, um, you know, the woman, uh, you know, have you ever raised anything, you know, from the dead or brought back an animal or anything like that? And she thought about it and she said, um, I did bring um, it through the translator. She said that she brought back a, uh, a shrimp to life and she was at um, some kind of um, dinner. And um, in China, they would have um, feed or um, serve shrimp with the head still on. And uh, um, yeah, uh, but it was a cooked shrimp. 
um, I think it was a cooked shrimp. It was either cooked or raw, but anyways, she was able to bring it back, um, to life. I'm pretty sure it was cooked, bring it back to life. And it started flopping around the table and everyone there couldn't believe it. Um, so, you know, how did she do that? She certainly didn't use the laws that you and I were taught in, in, you know, middle school, high school and college. Um, she tapped into higher dimensional physics where, um, it really is the door to infinite opportunity. And, um, uh, infinite uh, possibility, really. And so how can we do that more? You know, I think going in with a pure mind, pure intention, you know, is the way to do it. Because um, through the frequencies of love, that is where uh, creation can take place. If it's <clears throat> frequencies of greed and selflessness, um, you'll get distortion. And distortion may give you glimpses of, uh, of realities that you might be able to bring forth, but there also be misinformation in there. And so someone that's just trying to experiment, you know, with technologies and stuff, they're going to have <clears throat> to go through, you know, research and development, all the, you know, the protocols, um, and, uh, and, and they can also create things that, you know, and phenomena that you wouldn't even want to see that wouldn't be helpful and, um, and supportive. So, um, you know, uh, going in with a pure, pure thought and pure mind and knowing that we all have things that we're working on, but to see, you know, if that's where we are, um, if that's something we want to pursue is just looking at your, you know, life, are you <clears throat> cheating people? You know, are you, um, you know, dishonest, you know, cause everything in our life is really a, um, a ticket that we're buying. We're, we're really casting our vote for everything that we do. The food that we buy, if we're like, oh, you know, I, I don't care that much about organic food. I'm, you know, it's, it's expensive. I'm just going to buy these apples over here. Well, then you're supporting, you know, spraying, you know, our, our, our earth, you know, unintentionally, you know, perhaps, but we are, you know, supporting that. Um, you know, if you're, you know, um, you know, doing this, this and this, you're, you're supporting different things. So we all have to look at like, our lives and, and do our best. And there's not always other options. So, you know, uh, do your best. But, um, I started to do that myself is like, gosh, you know, I'm doing this, I'm wanting this in the world, but yet I'm actually supporting this. <clears throat> I need to change that. And so I've done my best, you know, and it's a, it's a process, <laughs> you know, to do more and more of that. Um, and, you know, going back to food, I mean, there's not always the opportunity to buy, you know, um, more consciously based food, you know, and so when when there is no other opportunity, you know, to do that and you need to eat, um, you know, is blessing, you know, that food and sending love and light, you know, um, to the, the tree, the process, the farmer. And that will actually transmute and change that energy. So it'll go from something that would be um, deemed as, you know, toxic to something that can be deemed as healthy. Um, but, uh, you know, I think um, one thing that I love is uh, in the olden days, people used to say grace and they would say it nowadays. People say it because it's the thing to say it, you know, Thanksgiving and, and you know, um, falling along with tradition. But <clears throat> the real reason why people said grace was they they didn't have some of the same uh, food preservation methods and stuff that we do today in cleanliness and you could actually change the character of the food and they knew this so they would hold the food you know they would hold their hands over their their meal and they would just send love and coherence to that food and it would actually change the physical composition of the food so then when the person ingested it it was um uh, in alignment with their bodies and, and, in in alignment with biology. And so that it's really, you know, if you can do it genuinely, it's really a powerful thing to do. If you're just going through the motions, you know, so everyone else sees you and you're like, yeah, you know, uh, <laughs> putting on a show or something. Um, but, um, and you don't even have to make it like really seen if you don't want to, you can just, you know, um, just focus for a minute and just change that food. But it's, it's a beautiful thing, you know? Yeah, I've definitely, I know doing that my. I know I've done that myself with food where it's like, you know, say it's, uh, you know, maybe meat because this is because I love meat, right? I'm a big meat guy. And so that's something where I started kind of thinking along the lines of people are like, oh, well, like, you know, if you're eating meat and the animal was scared, then you would take that into you as well. And I'm like, shit, there's probably some truth to that. <laughs> well, at the same time, I got some sort of download, but like what you're talking about where it's like, wait, you know, if someone put fear into it, loves a more powerful energy. I can transmute it. Yeah. And kind of at the same time, I had the same thought around grace, like what you're talking about. And it's like, wait, like, you know, 
I, I, I've always seen it in a religious context, but just because it's religious doesn't mean that it doesn't hold value. And I kind of realized what you were saying. I was like, wait, why don't I take time to bless the whole process, the chicken that laid the egg, the farmer that picked that mm-hmm. egg up, like, and literally mentally go through the entire process in my head, right? The farmer had to pick it up. The farmer then had to put it onto a truck of some sort. There was a truck driver that then took it, let's say to, you know, the local grocery shop who then someone placed it on the shelf and literally mentally rehearsed the <laughs> entire process that it would go through. That's awesome. And I kid you not, the, the food tasted better. <laughs> I have, yeah. I, I can't, I, I, I don't have, it's anecdotal, right? It's hundred percent anecdotal, but to me, that food actually tasted better. Every time I did that, I was more present with it and it felt like there was this more energetic alignment with me and the food as I was eating it. Mm-hmm. And, and something that also touches on this, cause multiple times you were talking about how, you know, the, the idea of love and the idea of fear. Well, this just clicked with me as you were talking about. I've never thought about this way before. You know, you think about temperature, right? If it's hot or cold. Well, all something that is cold is technically the absence of heat, right? Because, you know, you you look at anything and you just say that zero degrees. Well, it's technically not zero degrees because you could say that absolute zero would be Calvin, right? Zero degrees. Uh, I'm not, I guess, I guess <laughs> I'm looking at you as an engineer, but maybe I'm not sure where you <laughs> exist with all that, but you know, there's technically less than zero, but you go all the way down, there's absolute zero. But what that's saying is that the anatomical structure is no longer moving because there's no heat. Well, meanwhile, you just apply some heat to it, it gets hotter and yada, yada, yada. Well, now I'm viewing that as the same thing as like love and darkness or love and hate. It's like hate is like the baseline, like that's the zero point. But in order for us to transmute it, you just apply love to it. And it goes mm. back to what we were talking about earlier with these people who are coming from a hate, hate place, a hate filled thing. And it even goes to a religious thing where, you know, don't, you know, an eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind. And it's like, well, the reason somebody is in this hate or this anger is because they don't, they haven't experienced love. Like no one has actually physically given mm. them the energy of love. So if you want to elevate them on the spectrum, which is, which essentially hate is just life without love. So if you just give them that love, <laughs> you can literally transmute them out of that energy. I mean, of course they have to accept it, right? They're not, they can't just like, you can't just force love onto them, but, but it shows them that it is a transference, right? Like you can actually impose, not impose, but you can, you can say, Hey, here's, you know, if someone's cold, you can give them a blanket and hug them and transfer your little warmth onto them. But I'm realizing now as you were talking, it's like, holy shit, like hate is literally just life without love. Whereas you're, I mean, maybe I'm tra- I'm uh, rambling on top of myself, but I think you're, you're understanding where I'm going with this, where yeah, let's apply this to even technology. If mm-hmm. something is technologically created out of hate, out of fear, out of scarcity and the first thing popping into my mind is maybe the vaccine but we probably shouldn't go there because i'm not (laughs) i i'm not a biologist we'll we'll transpire that but if but if you're creating something out of hate or out of fear it's just anatom and anatomically anatomically not going to work as well as something that's actually being created out of love and trying to genuinely help other people and yeah i think that transfers all the way from a podcast episode all the way to you know these these principles that you're talking about from a engineer inventor standpoint yeah no you're absolutely right you know it's uh it's consciousness that really gives um you know gives gives the form you know um because there's a uh, a frequency to every you know little thing i mean you can pick up something you know even a uh, um you know a <laughs> box of uh, paper clips and if there was uh tremendous negativity you know that was made you know um during the the process of those paper clips they just don't feel right you know they don't feel good and and most mostly we wouldn't be registering you know um and picking up on that level of consciousness um, you know, subtle consciousness, but, um, we can, if we, if we really tap into it. Um, but also, like you said, I mean, you can actually go and bless those paper clips and you start to realize you can, in a sense, rewrite, you know, the history, um, you know, rewrite some of the program and the other person's experience and create, 
um, you know, uh, effective, you know, lasting, you know, uh, change, you know, on the planet. Um, and I think, um, you know, we have so many people that have come before us on this planet that have uh, sent out coherence and love and meditated and they're sending light and love to all beings, you know, and which we're all a part of, we're all connected. And so we can tap into that, like when we're feeling down and in a dark place, you can actually tap into that and and receive that blessing that's being offered up, you know, that's all around the planet. And as, as you um, partake in that and do the same, you know, like you with the, uh, the meat, um, you know, it, uh, it, it does have a, a big impact and much more than we, you know, realize, you know, it's sort of like the, uh, the fluttering of the, uh, the butterfly wings. We feel like, oh, you know, that can't have any effect, but, you know, a, a subtle breeze the, uh, that blows across our pond here, it can be just so soft and you see the ripple effect, you know, across the entire, Literally. you know, 70 acre pond, you know, so. Um, you know, it, it all does have a, you know, an effect. So every little thing you do, no matter how small, you know, you, you think it is, um, you know, or it can seem, you know, if you're doing something out of love and kindness and coherence, you know, it has transformational effects, you know, for the whole, you know, globe and the universe. So, um, you know, don't stop doing it, you know, uh, continue doing it and know that it is being felt and it, it, it makes an impact for all of us. Um, and, uh, yeah. I'm curious because I kind of want to, I'm all on board with everything you just said, but I kind of want to shift this back to the technology thing a little bit. And I think there's an interconnected thing here where have you, have you seen this before? If you have, I would I'd be interested if you've seen this before, if you haven't, I would love to know how this resonates with you where they have documented over history um, in places like you know, certain inventions, like whether it be the wheel, whether it be like pickaxes or pottery or, or something, but they documented well over 300 inventions that were created in different areas of the globe or the world at all the same time. You're shaking your head. Yeah. So you, yeah. you've seen this before? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, um, when the, uh, the consciousness, um, you know, on the planet rises, it's, um, it makes way for new information and new possibility to enter onto it. So, um, you have people coming up inventing planes, you know, the Wright brothers and I forget the other, uh, um, people, but, um, they had, you know, created, uh, an aircraft at the same time, you know, not knowing each other, you know, there's, um, when we go way back, we see the, uh, the, the flower of life symbol, you know, that was, um, in, you know, it looks like it was laser engraved or etched on, you know, um, uh, you know, different, uh, you know, pyramids and, and, um, you know, uh, rock structures all over the planet in different areas where, you know, at that time, seemingly there would be no way to cross the continents and so forth, you know, and, um, you know, and, and log graphs and stuff like that, you know, that, um, uh, you know, were, um, you know, thought to believe were the case at that time. Um, but yeah, it, it's, uh, um, as the vibration of the planet rises, um, new technologies, you know, um, are allowed to enter in and those that are just tuning into that frequency, um, you know, can start to receive that, um, and, and create a reality of it. And I think that's why at this time, you know, I know, um, I've seen videos on it. Um, I know, um, uh, uh, oh gosh, um, Proctor, uh, um, uh, what is his name? Foster Gamble. Um, he, he's, uh, um, he came out with the, uh, the documentary thrive and thrive Two, And they talk about, um, the, uh, free energy technologies that are being created on the planet. And <clears throat> certainly heard that from many other people as well. And so what's happening is, is, you know, these technologies need to come out sometimes simultaneously. So one, they don't get squashed. Um, and, and two, um, you know, they, they morph into more beautiful forms, you know, uh, you know, as well. Um, so yeah, that, that, that happens, you know, uh, and subsequently, you know, the reverse can happen if there's a focus on negativity and stuff, there'll be, you know, a desire for more wars and battles and stuff. Um, but, uh, the, the chaos that we see on the, the planet right now, that's not the view of the, um, the global population. It's a very small skewed view. And it's of course being propagated, you know, of course, um, by the media. And, uh, um, but that's not how most people are. Most people in their hearts of hearts, 
you know, are loving, beautiful beings. And a lot of us, you know, um, are just replaying what we've been taught, you know, um, but we're beautiful beings. And so, um, you know, we've all been programmed in different ways, you know, by our parents, by society, you know, um, you know, uh, videos, all that kind of stuff. But um, as we get away from that and we realize like there's infinite possibility, you know, you can start to tap into, you know, other, um, you know, levels of awareness and access synchronicity, which is an important one. So you may be able to receive ideas, but maybe you don't have any mechanical background on how to build it. But then through synchronicity, you connect with someone, you know, at the library and, and they love to build stuff, but they don't, you know, have anything to build and they have time on their hands and, and so forth. So, um, yeah, there's, there's, uh, it is interesting, um, you know, how, how um, things like that can propagate across this this whole globe simultaneously. And I think one thing, um, you know, that's really interesting is the four minute mile, right? Oh, you know, yeah. as soon as, um, you know, that four minute mile was broken, you know, which seemed to be the um, unachievable goal to run a mile in four minutes, you know, many people had tried, they had gotten close, no one could it was break like 50 it. 50 years as, or something, right? Like it was the, yeah, that was, was the mark for like 50 time. or 60 years or something. And as soon as one person broke it all around the planet, people started to break it. Even those that hadn't even heard that it was broken. Yeah. You know, oh, really? I, I mean, didn't know that. Part. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know yeah, that yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's something I want to kind of detour back to, which you kind of alluded to, but I would love to dive into the conspiracy aspect of inventions where I know I'm pretty sure with Nikola Tesla and I'm not too sure about it. And this touches on your free energy thing as well, which I think we should have a whole piece on in a second, but to stick with conspiracies where I think Nikola Tesla was essentially working with the free energy model, but then Westinghouse was using more of like this, uh, whatever the, what we're using today where you basically yeah, yeah. Would use coal or something to mine. Well, because Nikola Tesla's was like free energy, there's a conspiracy that he was essentially killed. And then um, I'm not too well versed in it. So that's why I'm kind of treading lightly here, but essentially that he was killed by the Westinghouse because Westinghouse wanted to make money off of electricity. If Nikola Tesla is just pulling it out of the atmosphere, you can't make money off of that. So there's, let's say conspiracies that he was killed. Well, a conspiracy that I know actually happened and they didn't even try to hide it was whenever the guy created the car engine that could run off of water, you know, and all it did was emit, you know, basically oxygen or something like hydrogen. And the only byproduct like was water, something like that. I don't remember exactly what it was. Well, like that was in the seventies and he just got killed. Like he, they didn't even try to hide it. It was like this guy, are you aware of that when that occurred? Yeah. You know, um, I think, uh, but so, you know, so, well, to, to wrap this real quickly, let me just wrap it up before yeah, yeah. I hear your thing is sure. because I'm, I'm bringing this up because you kind of touched on how the world might not be ready for it. Or you're saying how it comes out at the right time. So like it, you know, both of these instances would have been situations where people created something before it was ready and therefore, you know, it gets covered up almost. So I, I guess the question is, is, is that kind of allude to what you were saying or like, what's your opinion on that type of stuff? Yeah. You know, um, there have been, unfortunately, a lot of, um, you know, scientists and inventors that, um, uh, have been uh, taken out over the years. And um, a lot of inventors have also lived in, you know, a great sense of fear where they create something, but then they don't want to come out because they're concerned, you know, that, um, you know, they're just going to uh, um, be taken out as well. However, um, because of the collective consciousness and the frequency on the planet, that's happening less and less. Um, uh uh, you know, um, yeah, you know, there's, um, there's technologies that exist to be able to clean up the ocean I've heard in a day. And it seems like, oh gosh, how could you do that? There's not nets big enough. There's not, well, that's cause you're not using nets and you're not using some of these other, you know, uh, um, you know, things that people are using to clean up the ocean. So <clears throat> when the consciousness raises, you know, on the, the planet and new ideas enter into it, it's going to feel like more and more miracle time. I mean, before um, the advent of cell phones, you know, especially with um, the ability to access the internet on your phone, if someone said, 
you know, if you were in, in, um, you know, the, the sixties and someone said, oh, there's going to be this technology that comes forward, it'll be affordable, you know, everyone on the whole planet will have one, you hold it in your hand, and you can know the weather in any country, you can know, you know, what to do if you get a snake bite, uh, you know, um, you can learn, you can learn anything you want to learn, if you want to learn how to sew or to can, you know, can goods, you can, you know, at, at the you know, click of a button, people will be like, what on earth are you talking about? You know, how could a library of books, you know, fit into something that small, you know, how could, you know, that even be possible, right? And um, here we are, and we're all experiencing that. And it's sort of a reflection of om, omni, uh, omniscience, um, which is all knowing. And so, um, here we have a piece of technology in our hand that allows us to know information. Now we have to use discernment because there's a lot of misinformation as well, you know. Um, and I think the one of the reasons why, <clears throat> you know, um, arguably that we have to um, that there is so much misinformation is because it gives us the opportunity to be able to access discernment, especially at this time, which is you don't have the ability to. Um, you know, fact check every little bit of information you're told, you know, and um, there's propaganda. And how do you know what is what is right for you and your your family? And, you know, what's truth and what's not what's going on on the other side of the globe? Is that really happening? You know, is there other agendas? You have to be able to access discernment for our own survival, you know, as a species to be able to tap in and just know, like, what that person said, I can actually tell that they actually believe that, but it's actually not truth. Or, I, I, what that person said, they're actually lying to me, you know, and, um, uh, you know, so discernment is, you know, ex extremely important and, at this time. As and well. I think that it really helps with us getting in tuned with our intuition because yeah. you know, there's this level of, uh, understanding truth within ourselves. And I honestly, you know, you talk about people talk about how there's all the information's on the internet. You can see whatever you want, like you can find the answer to whatever you want. And I find it so beautifully chaotic because it opens us up to this ability to realize that we can almost create the reality that we want to create at any moment in time because all information exists. And where was I about to go with that? Um, oh, there's a test you can do where you can literally feel if you're lying, like you can feel the energy of lying. And it was so cool. Someone showed me this, like, you know, I'll say out loud, like I am Clayton. And then I can say, I am Ross. And you can feel that energy vibrate throughout <laughs> your body of lying. And it's like, shit, like <laughs> if you break this down into what we were talking about with lying and telling the truth, it's like, now, you know, what the frequency of lying feels like. So now mm. I get to discern <laughs> if somebody's lying to me or not, because I can feel that energy. Now, I think that you can only really truly feel that is if you're living authentically, because if you're not, then everybody's going to be lying because you're lying to everybody. You know what I mean? So it's, yeah. Wow. That's cool. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. I haven't thought about it that way, but yeah, you're right on. Absolutely. And it comes back to like the whole love thing. Like once you start operating from this field of love and energy and light, you can now feel when people are bringing guilt or shame or because you can now feel all the emotions that are underneath this higher level emotion. Mm, and so I, yeah. I've started just picking up on that. If someone says something, I'm like, you know, I'll call it out right away because if I start to feel shame when they say something, I'll be like, were you trying to shame me there? And, you know, first of all, sometimes it might be subconscious, like subconsciously, maybe they were, but consciously they're like, oh no, I wasn't. But even just that discernment within myself to be like, whoa, the frequency of shame was just shot at me. You can then, like you're saying, we said earlier, redirect it and just be like, nah, that's not, that's not in my best interest. <laughs> yeah, no, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. You, you start to realize too, like how, you know, um, you know, our words, you know, uh, words have frequency and vibration, um, so one of the things that's interesting is, is um, consciousness is, you know, the creator, right? And it comes from the universe, but it uh, expresses its, you know, itself through each one of us because we're um, part of creation. Um, and so words by themselves, unless there's a, if there's agreed, if there's an agreed upon collective vibrational frequency to them, they have their own 
frequency. For so, where I'm getting with this is is if you take um, uh, something like two jars, um, two empty jars, same size. You cook some rice on your stove, and you you dish out um, equal amount of rice into each jar. You know, it has to be somewhat moist rice, um, or it's better that way. <clears throat> um, you know, cap each one, write hate on one, uh, love on another. Mm -hmm. Those frequencies of those words will actually start to affect, you know, the rice inside them. Um, it's a neat experiment, um, you know, to do. And I did it uh, a number of years ago. And so um, what's even more awesome is to take the jar of hate, you know, and first ask the universe, is it okay if I express hate? Because hate's not something, you know, I love to express at all. Um, but for the experiment, you'll probably get, you know, a yes. And so unscrew the, uh, the jar lid and feel of something that makes you feel angry, you know, um, and just breathe onto the rice, you know, cap it and then just, you know, um, just relax for a minute, get into a better state clear of the being. energy. Yeah. Clear the energy Un unscrew the one with love and just picture love, you know, and just gently breathe into it or breathe into it the same way you did, you know, the, the hate one in terms of amount of breath. Um, but this time in love and cap it, you know, and, and come back in two weeks, you know, keep them in similar areas in your house, so, you know, a number of feet apart, um, same windowsill, same amount of sun or in a closet or whatever, and um, take them, unscrew the lids. And after a couple of weeks, you know, what we noticed was the uh, um, both fermented. Um, but the one that um, fermented with hate um, was just really like sour and disgusting. Um, and the one that was fermented with love smelled slightly sweet, you know, and uh, they had different colors to them as well. Um, and then you come back in like a month, month and a half, open those up. You better open the the hate one outside because <laughs> it is absolutely disgusting. Well, to give you a level, um, the, to give you a, smell. another layer of this, you don't, you could do a glass jar. And so then you don't even need to open them to smell them. Like you can see the actual rotting on the inside. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I mean, imagine if we did this in all of our schools, it was just part of the schooling. Right? Oh yeah. You know, is, um, you know, in, in fourth grade or whatever, we get the jar, you know, the kids would, you know, have fun cooking up the rice. They would, you know, write words, you know, on it, you know, um, you know, teasing or, you know, anger, whatever they wrote on the different jars and they sat them and, and waited, you know, a couple of weeks and then they looked at him, you would realize that your inner talk, you know, the words that you say to yourself matter tremendously, you know, what you're saying to others, you know, matter, you know, uh, tremendously as well. And I think we would all start to be gentler on ourselves and each other. That could, yeah. that could very easily be the most powerful lesson taught in school that is not taught. Like that'd be more powerful than all of schooling teaches you in 14 years, whatever the timeline is that you're in school for. I, I truly believe that because that would teach you the fundamental, that would teach you everything. That would teach you how there's this extra level of energy that then manifests in this physical reality, how there are mm -hmm. layers to this. And, and not to mention just if you're a kid, like that would break my mind. Like it breaks my mind today as an adult <laughs> like, yeah, to just I think know. like, what like what the hell just happened here like did someone you know what i mean like it would yeah yeah that would be such a profound experience to show you how this whole reality works like that would be beyond any podcast that'd be beyond any lesson you're gonna find in a book and that would just i mean that would just expand your mind so instantaneously that man that would be a great that'd be a great tool for any hopefully if there's some teachers listening do that in your classroom yeah yeah <laughs> yeah that's the that's the science lesson of today to try that out for yourself yeah. because i i'm all on board i've i've even seen um there was a uh there's a there's a couple things here number one there's a japanese scientist who did uh hidden messages in water who did like the same exact thing and showed how water would crystallize whenever given the positive words of love light energy but then negative like hate you know death it was like all murky when they would crystallize the mm -hmm. water um, and then there's also uh, like a um, a water manifestation you can do. And anybody who's listening, go check out my YouTube channel, slight plug, uh, <laughs> where and I show you how to do this. But there's like a two cup water manifestation where you take one cup and put your current reality in like you. You just visualize your current energy, your current reality. And then you take the other cup, which has your you know desired outcome, which is whether it's money, 
uh, you know, relationship, whatever, and, and put that intention on it. And then you blend the two waters together and then just drink from that new cup. And essentially the idea is, is that it will energetically align you at the cellular level. Cause now you're drinking the water that you just put all this energy into Wow! <laughs> to create and manifest your reality a lot faster, a lot quicker, you know, all the, all the stuff you have. And that's beautiful. I love that. I'm going to have to do that. Yeah, please do. Uh, <laughs> check it out on my YouTube yeah. channel. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's really cool. Yeah, I love that. You know, it's just uh, taking um, the current situation and the current ideas, adding new inputs and frequencies to it, and then, you know, symbolically ingesting it. And of course, our whole bodies are made up predominantly of water and just having that information carry out. And yeah, that's that's uh, that's really beautiful. Are you sure um, you didn't go to school for engineer? You're, you're talking like an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my my dad used to talk about um, you know aging, and he said, you know, um, it's been proven that every you know cell in our body is replaced. I think it's every seven years. Some you know are every couple of years, and um, the oldest ones, I guess, every seven years. And so he used to say, you know, so what part of you is aging? you know, and it's really, he would say, it's the program, you know, what we're telling ourselves. So there's this collective program throughout the globe that says like, oh, when you get into, you know, this age bracket, you'll start to experience this or, you know, there'll be a degradation here. And then, and so there's this collective belief that, you know, most of humanity is bought onto and subconsciously we are playing that program and fulfilling it. But we can um, consciously uh, reprogram our own experience because higher ideas uh, win the right of way. And so if if that is something that you want to change in your life, you can start talking to your cells. You can start uh, start talking to your body and your experience. And um, my dad would say, you are the captain of the ship and all your your cells, so to speak, are taking orders from the captain. And so, you know, talking to them and you can get, you know, phenomenal, you know, results, you know, and, um, and, and reverse effects, you know, that seemingly would not be able to be reversed. So I think it's really important that we realize that we are creators, that we're all conscious, you know, on some level, um, and that we can become more conscious and it's never too late. It's never too late. So you might have, you know, live in a life of, you know, um, you know, self abuse and and uh, negative talk. You can change that today. You know, right here on on Clayton's show, you can change that, <laughs> and uh, um, and and start to realize that you are a phenomenal being. You know that um, you are meant to be on the planet, and the evidence is is you're here. You know, and um, you are truly you know uh, loved and appreciated by the universe. Uh, my father used to say that the universe acts as if we're its only creation. That's how much we are each individually loved. And a lot of us have no concept of that or awareness of that, but that's how loved we are. And we can choose, the universe also loves us so much, we can choose to have the illusion of separation and, uh, and um, you know, not feeling special and not feeling loved, you know, because the universe loves you so much you can, it, it won't infringe upon your free will. So you can have that experience as well. But one is much more fun than the other. And so, um, you know, and, and one brings you to new levels of awareness where, you know, more and more of the ego starts to fade away. And, you know, I, I remember years ago when I, um, I used to do a lot of dirt biking and, um, and stuff and, and uh, paintball and, and stuff when I was little. And so when I sold all that stuff, there was, um, and I had to, you know, um, financially, there was an element of me that was like, oh my gosh, I'm no longer this. Like I held that as part of my identity. And then it occurred, no, no, those are just things that you did, you know, and that, you know, the things around us, they really don't define us. They don't have to define us. So if you're, you know, you know, um, having something being taken away from you or you lose it or whatever through, you know, the financial changes or whatever that's going on in the world, you know, that isn't who you are. You are a, a beautiful spiritual being, you know, having a human experience. And we can go back to, you know, that that spiritual aspects of us, um, which are complete, you know, which um, give us access to all sorts of different information and abilities. And you can feel, 
just as happy, you know, more joyful than you ever have, you know, by connecting into this. And I think the best way to connect into it, because a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, I, I can't meditate. Thoughts come to my mind. You know, I was that way. I was never interested in meditating. You know, our, our technologies like our core harmonizer, you know, if, uh, if there's, um, you know, a center near you and we have a list on our website, conscious technologies, LLC.com, um, where, um, it says locations and centers. And there are a number of, I think different, eight different, uh, centers that are open in the U S across, um, you know, um, the country. Um, but, uh, um, uh, it, you know, that technology allows you to enter into a meditative state more easily so that you can connect to higher levels of awareness. But if you don't have that, um, uh, you can do that on your own, you know, and I think it, it really starts to put positioning yourself, um, in, 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 in an environment that helps facilitate that. So going out to nature barefoot, if you can, you know, um, glass of water, you know, no cell phone, you know, and just go under a tree and just start to, you know, let go and just become more of an observer and don't try to overthink it. And it's okay if thoughts enter into your mind, you know, um, but um, just being still, you know, you'll start to be able to, um, you know, turn on all sorts of abilities. You can, um, I know people and, and, and can do some of this myself, where you can turn on abilities to see auras, you know, um, these uh, visual color manifestations, you um, you know, that, um, are projected out of people. And when you can do that, you can start to see, you know, people's intent, you know, uh, what they're working through. How did you, um, healers, how you, did you learn how to do that? Um, just, well, these technologies helped me a lot. Um, cause I was around them and being able to be in a meditative state, um, uh, um, um, you know, without having to work at it. Um, but, uh, um, basically what I found is, um, if you want to see, like energy. Um, if you enter into, um, a dimly lit room, um, next time you're um, visiting with your friend or your spouse or something, um, you know, and you're in a dimly lit room, you know, it's not dark, but it's uh, not very light. Um, uh, sit across from each other on two different couches or a couch and a chair and just have a regular conversation. And just, you can have your glasses on or off if you wear glasses. So if you have contacts, it's not a problem. And just sort of like sort of soften your eyes a little, just like you're you're totally aware of whoever you're talking to, but it's just you start to relax a little. And then all of a sudden, um, you know, when the time is right, you'll see almost like this haze, almost like on a hot road. If you've seen a hot road in the summer, the the air sort of looks like, you know, it's it's doing something different. Um it's, it's almost like that. And you'll start to see that around someone's generally their head. Um, and it could, maybe it's only going out a half an inch or an inch could be going out feet. But for most people, you know, when they start to see it, it's probably going to be half inch or an inch or something out. And when the person moves their head, you'll see this field sort of move with them. And, um, and it follows. Sometimes it's even slightly delayed in how it moves. Um, some people can see color. I've only seen color a couple of times. Um, I just see this, um, this clearness, um, and, uh, um, and if someone has an injury, you know, sometimes, you know, a shoulder injury, it might pop out differently. Um, the energy, um, you know, can look like that, but, um, this is, uh, um, non, these are non-physical fields that we're able to physically see through sort of like a, um, translation process that only really occurs when you start to raise your vibration. Um, that being said, some people are born with this ability. Um, it's totally a learned ability, so anyone can do it. Um, and even people that are, um, you know, have other, you know, uh, struggles in their life in terms of, um, uh, you know, maybe they're, um, it, it, pretty much anyone can do this if you start to, um, open that door. Um, what you really want to do though, is as you're opening these doors, make sure that you're living, you know, a life of, you know, love and kindness and joy as best as you can, because then you're opening up doors, um, and possibilities to things you really want to propagate. Um, you know, otherwise you can open up things that you may not, you know, uh, you know, um, you know, find very interesting might, um, and, and disturbing. Um, so a good example is if you're if you love watching horror movies and, you know, gory movies and stuff. This is probably not something you want to open a door to, 
um, until you find yourself not interested in watching horror movies. You know, if you, um, because it, it you can open up doors of possibility that of things that will manifest that you wouldn't want to see because it's just a reflection of what your focus is and where your thought is. And so you can get distorted views of things too that wouldn't be something you would really want to see and can be concerning. Um, however, <clears throat> um, you know, if you um, get away from, you know, watching horror movies and, and having that element of attraction in your life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you don't watch CNN. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, it's amazing what you can open up to. And we all have this. And even if you do open a door that you wished you hadn't, you know, just focus on sending love and light and coherence and it'll either transmute or uh, transfer or whatever that experience is. So, so then are you able to um, see like my aura sitting here right now? Um, I, ha I haven't, uh, cause I haven't really been focused on it. I don't, uh, try moving like a little back and forth. I th the light, um, in your ceiling or being reflected is a little harder for me see to see. So I'm not quite seeing. Oh, okay. I mean, I guess it kind of vibrates a little. Oh, we can turn it off. Does that help? Okay. Yep. I'm seeing it. It's it's like the road haze that I talk about. Um, not um, uh, you know, rose uh, uh road um. Yeah, like the you know, effect. The... Not haze. <laughs> you have a good, good aura. You know. Okay. Tight. Thanks. I want to say haze. <laughs> That's what I was just looking for. <laughs> I believe you now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I can. It's it's tracing as you're moving back and forth. The the uh, screen, you know, that I'm looking at isn't super crisp, but when you move back and forth, I can see. You can see um, like a trail uh, of it. Yeah, it's like this, um, um, like clearness that's um has isn't quite as transparent as normal reality. You know, moving around, and I can see see that effect. You know, as you're moving, especially at the top of your head. Uh, it's like it, it kind of see, you're yeah. saying it's like mostly like from here on your head i'm seeing it to here and other people might see a lot more they might be seeing color okay you know and so forth but that that's what i can see anyway is that but, just a process of i guess clearing uh, yourself more of like elevating your own vibration so like as you let's say would become more enlightened or more vibratory <laughs> more towards the light you would be able to see color is that kind of how it would work yeah um that and, uh, you know, not putting some of the um, program limitations that we've learned, you know, um, when when we go in with um, an, a more open mind um, and you can be a, a, a healthy skeptic, that's OK. You don't have to be like, oh, I, I, I totally believe it. Um, you can be a healthy skeptic, you know, um, but just going in with more of an open mind. Um, I know my dad in one of his um, uh, lectures that's also on our website under the resource tab. Um, he, he, uh, talks about communicating with an insect and how, um, Whoa. uh, what he had to do was not see the insect as like a brain this big and my brain's this big. Um, he, uh, had to see it as, um, you know, equal as this universal consciousness as this one mind, if you will. And when you start to see things in new lights like that, all of a sudden it opens up doors to being able to communicate, you know, with pets. You know, um, I know people that can communicate with pets very well and hear their thoughts. And and uh, it comes through as a translated language in the English language because it's ideas. Right. And um, we receive our ideas, you know, in, um, you know, thoughts in the human language if we're if we speak English. Um, so, you know, sometimes that that will manifest that way. Um, but a lot of times these, you know, th these people that are very successful at it will tell you, you know, that they see the animal as this, you know, uh, beautifully conscious being, it's not like, oh, that stupid dog or whatever. It's like, right. <laughs> if you have those thoughts, you're not going to be communicating with the, uh, the dog, um, in that way. But if you have it as like, oh my gosh, wow. Like we have this connection and like, let's explore, um, They've done studies, and I'm sure if you go on YouTube, you can find some of these <clears throat> um, where they've um, – and I know Cleve Baxter, who wrote uh, the book um, The Secret Life of Plants, you know, which is an amazing book on communicating with plants. And you think, well, you know, how a plant has a thought, a plant – yeah, yeah. And, and um, so they did um, – 
they've done studies where they've taken someone that, um, you know, has a really good relationship with their pet, you know, their small little, you know, dog or their cat. Um, and, uh, um, the studies that I've seen were dogs, um, and they, um, you know, have a camera on the, um, individual or, um, and the dog. And they find that like, if, if the owner is going to do a flight right at the point of takeoff, when there's more anxiety for that, you know, um, uh, the owner, the dog will feel anxious, you know, um, and, uh, subsequently when the individual is coming home before you could audibly hear, even using a dog's ear, the car coming down the street or whatever, the dog, you know, they'll have video cameras. The dog will get up and move in a different position in the house or by the door or whatever person opens the door. And it just looks like the dog may have just run in to say hello, but the dog had known ahead of time. And so it's obviously tapping into this higher dimensional consciousness, you know, which is accessible to us all. And that's, we see this so well and so beautifully in the animal kingdom. Like when you see a flock of birds, they're all acting on one consciousness, right? It's not like one bird's like, okay, everyone turn left. What, what did you say? And the birds are running into (laughs) each other, right? It'd be chaos, but it's, they've tapped into this one consciousness, same thing with the school of fish. They just dance together, you know, equal distances apart. Right. I mean, they aren't like bumping each other and someone's not, you know, out of tune. Um, And they've even trained dogs to be able to tell whenever a kid's about to have a seizure. Right. And then the dog like, is like, Hey, yo, this, you're about to have a seizure. Like, let's get on the ground. And then they have a seizure like a couple seconds later. It's like, what the fuck? Like they are tapped into this different layer of communication and, and consciousness kind of like what you're talking about, which is yeah. absolutely fascinating. And I'm, my dog barks way too much <laughs> and I, I, I try, I'm trying to like communicate on that level, but it's, <laughs> it's kind of difficult, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, but what I did come across actually recently on TikTok, there's this chick who she doesn't have too many followers. And I, I don't know if that's a good thing or bad thing, but she, she does like telekinesis, which is literally being able to like move clouds or she'd have like a ball of tinfoil and she'd move it like back and forth without touching it. And I I mean, there is a skeptical portion of it where I'm like, is that actually so? But you know, even with like the cloud, she would be like sitting there, like moving it apart with her fingers. And I I mean, clear as day, you can see (laughs) that the the cloud is actually separating exactly where she kept like placing her, you know, finger energy on. So I, to me, I, I'm still trying to figure out what to make of it. And I'm actually starting to like now see if I can play with it. Um, and the one video she talked about like chi, she was saying like, you know, in the Eastern, I'm not sure who talks about, it. I don't know if it's like karate or martial, what martial art, or if it's like the Buddhist, but they talked about how chi and like everything has chi, whether it's, you know, a, a, um, a lamp or a, animal or a plant and what she was saying is she would just focus on the chi of the object and be able to like use her finger to move it she did it with plants where she would get it to like kind of flail in a weird direction like completely different wow. from what the wind was doing like the wind would be blown one way and she, or she would move her finger like the opposite way and you would see like the the that corner of the plant moving the opposite direction of the wind yeah. it's like and to me, it's just like, holy shit. Like, you know, the, the limitations that we have placed on our mind are just so insane that, you know, it, it comes to even what you're saying, where it's like you can just receive downloads of, to do these incredible things. Yeah, no, that's that's so cool. You know, um, some people call the um, the cloud um, phenomenon cloud busting. Yeah. And um, uh, so it, it's a great activity to do by yourself, especially starting off or with, you know, someone that you don't feel like you have to impress, um, but just lay down on, on the, uh, the grass, you know, look up at the sky, you know, pick a cloud, you know, not don't pick the biggest one probably, but pick, you know, a smaller one and look at the other clouds around it. And then, you know, clo- I find closing my eyes works best. And, um, and then for me, I almost make this like, <laughs> you know, um, like breath work in, in my mind. And I just see like the, the cloud, like, um, you know, disintegrating and just turning into, you know, atmospheric, you know, clear, you know, air. And, um, uh, you know, it's just, uh, it, it's amazing because you'll see other clouds, you know, and the, you know, clouds are constantly forming and disappearing as well. But, um, you'll see that the cloud that you focused on, you know, just dissipates, you know, significantly faster, you know, 10 seconds, 30 seconds, you know, something like that. Um, 
And, but you also find that if you're trying to impress someone, you know, and you're like, Hey, you know, this is possible. And especially if they really, um, you know, have, uh, more than a healthy, uh, uh, you know, amount of, um, you know, doubt, you know, to it, um, uh, you know, it can influence what you're trying to do. Um, uh, but, you know, obviously, you know, this woman you, uh, you know, watch, she, uh, you know, was able to do it. And I, and I think, um, the more, you know, we're able to just divorce ourselves from other opinions and other lower idea inputs that are trying to, you know, cloud that ability, um, you know, programs. Um, and we override those programs that are like presenting themselves to us, especially from the ego, you know, in ourselves, you know, you can get that phenomena. It's, it's absolutely amazing. They, I don't know if you've seen yet too, they call it the, uh, uh, the pie wheel and they take like a, if you take, um, like um, some silly putty or something, um, stick it on your table and then take a, a needle and stick it in, you know, the, the putty or the, the, the clay might be better. So it doesn't slowly tip over um, piece of clay, you know, stick it, you know, uh, tip up and then fold like a, uh, <clears throat> almost one of those little fortune teller things that we used to make, you know, when, when you were in school. Um, so just sort of like a little um, paper pyramid, it could even be out of tin foil too. That might be easier. Um, and set it on the, the tip of the needle place, you know, a drinking glass over it. So, you know, it's not your breath or your, mm. your, you know, um, you know, the fan and the she room did this or whatever. Too. Oh, she did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And you can move that, you know, with your mind. Um, and, uh, uh, it's amazing. I, I've just had very, you know, uh, uh, small evidences of that. You know, I, I wouldn't say I could do that you know, um, that particular one, but, um, I, I know for sure that it's a real thing and, and, um, and have seen others do that. Um, I went to, um, a, uh, spoon bending conference years ago down in Washington, DC, okay. there were about 30 people there. And the guy that, um, uh, ran it was, um, uh, um, well, I probably shouldn't say, but, um, he, he was, he was a CEO of a big company. Um, I think since then he's passed on, but, um, amazing guy. And, uh, anyways, we, um, he hands out silver, uh, silverware that he would pick up from, uh, you know, estate sales or, um, garage sales and stuff. And, um, he would tell you to, you know, hold the, you know, um, the spoon in your hand and picture the metal getting softer and, he first went through a whole presentation, um, describing, um, and showing illustrations and pictures of like big, like one inch steel bars that had been, uh, apparently pulled by people like this, which, um, uh, um, I, I remember Penn state university analyzed, um, some of these, um, uh, uh, bars and stuff that were reported to be, um, uh, um, bent, um, and pulled apart by people. And the amount of strength testing and tensile testing was just astronomical, you know, to do this. And they also, um, analyzed the, uh, um, the, uh, the metal, um, and, uh, and looked at, you know, certain, you know, um, patterns and the structure of the metal and, uh, metallurgy and, uh, um, and they could tell that, um, the metal actually heated up um, before, you know, it could do this. And, uh, there was interesting effects that they were able to get, um, by, by doing this mentally. So anyways, I'm at this spoon bending conference and, you know, I have an open mind to have shown up. My father was there and, and, uh, my family, um, you know, back then. And, uh, we were there and, um, he hold, you know, we all pick our spoons and stuff. And he said, you know, you can put your hand on it and you can, you know, <clears throat> just picture it getting softer and so forth. And, you know, people are doing that. He's like, don't like physically bend it because, you know, there are cheaper spoons. You could physically bend sure. it if you wanted to. Um, and some people did. Um, but then um, as you're doing it without any notice, he just yells, bend, bend like that, like super loud. And it shocked people. Right. Because you're not expecting you're trying to like you think you're focusing on it. But what happened was is um, it takes your focus off of the object you're trying to bend shifts it to him. And you're like, what on earth is going on? And then, you know, some people, mine didn't do this, but some people's spoons, literally they're holding in their hand and it's just, you know, bent right over, you know, like that. Because Other people giving, were, is it because you're giving your energy to him and his focus uh, is to bend it? No, um, it's, it's giving it to the object that you were focusing on, but, um, uh, our human mind is, uh, hindering, uh, 
you know, this ability from coming through. So it's distracting the human mind uh, uh, to allow to distract the you know, logical to, mind. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's like the letting go and, of um, manifestation. Exactly. Uh, you know, and, and other people, you know, including me, were able to take the, uh, the um, you know, the spoon and like twist it like taffy. So I did physically grab it, but I wasn't muscling it. And afterwards, um, we stayed because uh, my my father knew this guy. And um, uh, and uh, so after everyone pretty much had left, um, we were talking to the guy that put on this uh, event. And uh, he said um, uh, he, he walked around because people had left a lot of the silverware because you did it with many different pieces and and so forth throughout the evening and he would pick up ones and he would see he would say like see this one right here because of the tightness of the bend you can tell this person manually bent it you know over here you can tell by looking at the metal this was manually bent this one over here was actually mentally bent you know with um you know some assistance um and so forth and it was it was amazing to see and we i ended up um teaching uh, or uh, my parents ended up doing this um uh, at a family event one time. And, uh, my aunt who, uh, is no longer around. Um, she, um, uh, became the best, you know, spoon bender. It was just absolutely amazing. She was bending all the silverware and, and, uh, just, uh, amazing. She was the best one in the family that could do it. Um, and it was just, it wasn't cause she knew more. Um, you know, it was just, she was able to divorce herself from, you know, the human mind, you know, more, and just was, perhaps open to more possibility. Um, maybe there's and, a level of ego. Uh, I think there's probably a level of ego too, where if you are wanting to do it from ego, that that energy is going to prevent you as opposed to just like purely wanting to see if you are able to do it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. So if yeah. you're ready for this, let's scale, let's scale this conversation. Um, Uh-oh. so I, are you familiar with, uh, the raw, the law of one, the raw stuff? raw material um i've i've heard about it i I haven't looked into it yeah so it's it's dense right like these Mm -hmm. you know channelers essentially did uh channel the being of raw you know for i I don't know months or something like it's a thick book like i i think i downloaded the pdf or the uh, audible thing it's like 30 hours long of just material but so what i did was is when i went to egypt i got some sort of intuition to type in and see what raw says about the pyramids and Mm. what and so you can go online and look up the law of one materials raw and then search in a keyword and so i searched in pyramids and there's a solid 20 minute read 30 minute read you can find of every single instant in the raw materials where they mention pyramids and you would love this because they talk about the uh geometry of it the position it was in um, you know, it, it talks about so much stuff, how it was used for healing, how the alignment of it was in the certain planetary alignment. But, mm. but where this, where, where I want to start with this is they say that what happened was, is that they created it from a pure thought form and essentially created it instantaneously out of thin air, just using, wow. and, and it's hard to explain because this kind of goes back to our higher dimensional physics where they're trying to essentially explain higher dimensional physics to a three dimensional person using English, which isn't the best language in the world, but <laughs> you know, it, <laughs> and so what they essentially said was, is that they got to a place of pure thought form and then they were able to create the pyramids essentially instantaneously into where they are today. So <sighs> I don't really even know what to make of that. The the thing is, is that all of it makes sense and fits every single bill of what we're talking about of, of, okay, we, we still don't know how they made it, but it's, it's like so hard for the mental human mind to comprehend it, but it into intuitively, it makes sense. So I don't, I don't know if you've ever heard of that before, but uh, when you were talking about the steel getting pulled apart, just from, you know, this tensile strength of it would have been, maybe several tons and no humans can actually pull that. Well, it's like, well, it's like, that's a small scale of even just saying, Oh, well, the pyramid was constructed from this pure thought form of just having clear mind and perfect intention of wanting to use it as this healing modality for humans to be able to live longer, to progress society in the best interest. So I'm curious if you've ever heard of that or how that kind of jives with this whole conversation to you. 
Yeah, you know, I had not heard of that、um, in terms of you know being instantaneously created. You know, I I, I know <laughs> that they didn't use、uh, copper chisels and little hammers to you know come up with the the degree、uh, um, and accuracy which they say even with modern day technology they couldn't build that to the、um, degree of accuracy and you know even the the cracks in between the rocks are like you can't even slide like a piece、It's、of paper、crazy. you know between yeah、it. when I went man it's insane and,、uh, how tight like and I'm looking at this I'm like you're serious there's no mortar in here like we've tested that <laughs> everyone's like yeah we didn't use, they didn't use any mortar I'm like that doesn't make sense、wow. like you look at it and it looks like it's welded together wow that's amazing yeah yeah I've never seen it in person and I just you know heard about it and my dad he studied you know the、uh, a lot of time on the pyramids I just you know、um, Have you know heard a little over the years from him,、um, but、uh, yeah, you know it's、um, they certainly、um, whether it was created instantaneously or、um, or not, you know, and maybe it was、um, their,、uh, you know, maybe they were able to somehow like shrink time, you know, create it, and you know, I mean, collapse time. I mean, which is all possible. It's hard to wrap our human minds around something like that,、um, but.、Uh, Um, yeah, you know, it, it was definitely created using higher dimensional technology. Whether that higher dimensional technology took physical form and it was in the form of light and sound, which I had heard, you know, that they may have used light and sound and frequency to cut those stones rather than, you know,、uh, saws and so forth.、Um, and you know, levitation, you know, which can be done apparently with sound and and sound frequencies.、Um, there's um, uh, uh, Crystal Castle down in Florida. I'm not sure whereabouts it is, but my parents years ago went down to look at it, and the the guy was、um, who created it was like、um, something Skeller.、Um, I forget the guy's name, but it's called Crystal Castle. And there's the、um, presentation that the Rangers give you, which is you know this guy built、uh, um, you know the the castle.、Um, I, I just heard this through someone else that had had、uh, gone to visit, but.、Um, He said that the the rangers tell you the story that the guy built this castle for you know his loved one you know that left him at the altar and so forth, and they had、um, so called explanations for you know how things you know were made there that just didn't make sense.、Um, but one of、um, you know the things you know that、uh, is is apparent that that the who、uh, this this guy was able to use higher dimensional technologies to create this castle. Um, and he he worked by himself, and his neighbors.、Um, he's no longer around now, of course. But、um, his neighbors、um, had reported that he he would work at night, and um, apparently um, he had、uh, gotten this huge delivery of granite or something, you know, some kind of giant stone, you know, for、um, uh, uh, for his castle. And when it got dropped off,、um, he told the guy to like walk. Just around、um, out of view to some bushes or something, and、um, when the guy came back, the rock you know had been removed from the truck, and he didn't have any other equipment, and、uh, you know, and so you know, there's of course a lot of speculation, you know, of what you know could have happened, but、um, he definitely used.、Um, I remember my dad saying that there was different wires and、um, uh, you know cables and stuff like that,、um, but more like for. Um, in either information flow or、um, electrical or something that were in his workshop, and somehow I think he must have been able to find an electrical frequency or something to be able to lift these giant stones up and basically levitate them off the truck.、Um, and I don't know how he did it, but、um, you know, w- you know, there's we have these phenomenon, you know, and these examples across you know、um, the globe, you know that. Clearly illustrate, you know, th- there's、um, a lot more capability that's available <laughs> to us, you know, and it wasn't,、um, you know, we think of like the, you know, the times of the horse and buggy and stuff, but there was、um, other times on the planet when tremendous technology was available, and、uh, um, you know, I think we're reaching that standpoint again,、um, and we need to for the survival of the planet. Um, we need to bring forth、um, higher dimensional technologies to clean up some of the misbehavior of mankind,、um, but also、um, reconnect to our levels of awareness and consciousness, where you don't need some of the, the vast amount of stuff that we, you know, tend to have and accumulate, you know,、um, you know, in order to live or,、um, you know, feel fulfilled. 
I believe we've alluded to it, but I'm curious how or what you would say if someone's listening to this and they're a skeptic. I I mean, I think majority of the audience is probably going to be like, oh, okay, this makes sense. But if someone's listening to this and they're skeptic and they're like, you know, higher dimensional physics, what is this guy talking about? If hell, if they, first of all, if, if you're a skeptic and you made it to this far in the podcast, <laughs> shout out to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, like, yeah, you're open minded enough. So, <laughs> what would you, what would you kind of say to that? Like, what would be something that you could point to somebody to think or to do? Or is there a way that you could kind of transform your consciousness? And I think it's also interesting. We're talking about this on Earth Day, but <laughs> <laughs> is there a way you'd be able to shift that, or like, like something that you could see in this physical world that would? say, oh, there has to be some sort of higher level d- d- physics at play here. Yeah, you know, um, I think the first thing comes to um, you you can't violate someone's free will by forcing upon someone, you know, the ability to understand, you know, um, you know, uh, higher dimensional physics and and the amazing abilities that we have within us if the person is open-minded and truly open-minded and not just trying to sit there and battle, you know, you, um, uh, you know, there is, uh, you know, things, some of which we touched about, you know, on on this uh, podcast with, you know, just looking, how would you explain, you know, a school of fish or, you know, a school, um, a flock of birds being able to fly, you know, together, you know, as one, you know, without, you know, bumping, you know, uh, we lived in the, uh, the, um, uh, one of the uh, um, major flyways um, of birds um, in Delaware um, and Newark, Delaware, um, when I was growing up and down there, I'd never seen anything like it since. Um, but we lived there for many years and we'd see it uh, a couple of times a year. The whole sky would turn black and it would be this black river of birds just flying and it could go on for a half an hour you know, um, and it would just be the sea. And if, if they flew above you and you clapped, you know, the, the whole river would move, but it was, um, I would say, you know, a hundred feet wide, um, at least maybe sometimes a couple hundred feet wide. Um, and it would go on for a half an hour and birds were this close together. I mean, you know, it was, it was just, you know, yeah. I mean, it was just absolutely, it, it literally was black. You know, you would see this black, uh, river of birds flying above your head. And I'm sure there's got to be YouTube videos if you want to see what it looks like, but it was phenomenal. You know, so I would, I would um, say the like, you know, look at, look at that, you know, look at like, how, how can that occur? How can we have, um, you know, this unison of birds and, you know, you can always look at things and be like, well, some of them don't make it or occasionally one crowd, you know, whatever. I mean, their analogies can break down as well, you know, if you really you know, want to fight them, you know, but um, just look at like a, 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 a school of fish, you know, thousands and thousands of fish, you know, and how they're all, you know, operating with, you know, this seemingly one mind consciousness, you know, so um, we're in the animal kingdom as well. So you know, why are we different? I think it's because of our ego and our programming. Um, and, you know, this um, separation that we built, you know, uh, from us and, you know, universal mind and, and creation. So, you know, that's, you know, um, one thing that I would look at. And then the other thing that we, you know, touched on, too, is the placebo effect. How do you explain the placebo effect? You know, it can only be explained, you know, using consciousness. If someone believes that the sugar pill or this, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, the surgery, uh, fam's uh, surgery will actually make an impact and it does. And the person actually heals, they get better. Um, you know, there was the, uh, the movie, the secret that came out, you know, many years ago right. and, um, uh, with Lisa Nichols and it was just an amazing, you know, video. They focused a lot on like material manifestation and, um, you know, uh, trying to accumulate wealth and stuff too. Cause I think that's also where the consciousness on the planet was as well. Um, so that was the focus, but there was this man in there, um, called the, the miracle man. I don't know if you remember him, but he was the one that with the cowboy had and, and he had gotten in a plane crash and, um, he had organs and bones and stuff that had, you know, been broken. And they said, there's no way we can, you know, uh, fix or, you know, um, some of these organs and all that kind of stuff. So he was in the hospital 
And um, he had to blink in order to talk and communicate. So they would hold up an alphabet and he would blink and was able to communicate that way. And he was on a breathing apparatus and everything. And they said, you know, you'll never um, breathe on your own again and you'll never walk. And he said, um, I'm going to walk out of here um, on Christmas Day, I think it was, or the day it was either Christmas Day or the day before. And um, sure enough, um, you know, everyone doubted that he could do it. They said, there's no possible way. There's pieces that are missing and, you know, chopped up and there's no, we can't do anything. And, um, and he just kept hearing um, this message within him. He said that, you know, to breathe deep, breathe deep, breathe deep. And he did. And sure enough, on his own two feet, you know, Christmas Day, he walked out of the hospital. Now he was, you know, walking super slow and, you know, he was obviously still going through a lot but he did exactly what they said was impossible. And so when we start to, um, there are many examples of this, right? I mean, uh, and phenomena uh, and stories of things. And so I think if we um, are open-minded and we don't throw out that data, because it's easy to hand pick the data and say, oh, this is impossible, here's my data, but what about that data? You know, so I, I would just encourage people to just look at like, how do we explain that? You know, there has to be something else other than the programs that we were taught. Um, it's really and, quite uh, amazing and, too. Like there's no shortage of those, of those examples. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I think also being easier on yourself too, just cause you know, you know, if you're 60, 70, 80, a hundred years old right now, and you haven't gotten any of that, you know, through your worldly experience, don't be hard on yourself. I mean, some people, you know, are born in with gifts, other people, you know, s slowly discover them, you know, um, sometimes people go through horrific things that then turn on those abilities. You know, sometimes the darkest times can actually <clears throat> um, propel us into the light, you know, and greater understanding, you know, um, more easily. So, you know, don't be hard on yourself and just, you know, keep an open mind and um, and explore and have fun, you know, doing. I would I would love to double back to the free energy concept, because this is something that I was originally exposed to when I was researching Nikola Tesla and it was very hard for me to grasp it because it seemed like they were finding the energy that was between atoms and extracting that to create energy in our reality. I don't, I have no idea if that's even the right interpretation of it. I tried exposing it to my brother, who's an aerospace engineer, um, computer engineer background, and he d dismissed it very quickly, but I knew that there, you know, I we will just leave it at that. But to me, it still felt like there was some truth to it. And you brought it up earlier. So what is the free energy concept and what would the astral realm or higher dimensional physics tell us about free energy? Yeah, you know, um, uh, I haven't created anything in that, you know, area myself, but, um, you know, I've certainly heard and researched and heard about other, um, you know, inventions and so forth. Um, uh yeah, it's, it's, uh, using, um, geometry, you know, um, uh, you know, magnetism, I think is going to probably be one of the, you know, first examples that ends up, you know, uh, you know, hitting, um, you know, the world in terms of being propagated. First of all, you know, I strongly, you know, believe and have heard and, uh, that there's already free energy devices, many of them out on the planet. It's just they have been either squashed or the inventors, you know, are um, intimidated and don't want to, you know, come out with them. So it's already um, a thing, you know, on the planet. It's just a matter of when will it be um, uh, allowed to come out for the use of mankind. Um, and that, you know, um, is a question of really coherence because even, you know, when it's not, um, the idea is already, uh, in mind, it's already been created, but coherence in terms of the control, control structure and stuff like that has to change, you know, the desire to, um, you know, uh, um, you know, control people and, and, uh, profit off of everyone and so, so forth. Um, some of the energy, uh, models on the planet just have to change, um, for this to be allowed to come, you know, forward. And it will. Um, it's just a matter of time. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, I think um, uh, I had heard magnets is is going to be a part of it. And, um, you know, there's this amazing magnetic field, right? I mean, that, you know, um, when you really think of a magnet, I mean, uh, 
you know, how it, how it can have, you know, opposing, you know, or attractive forces, um, you know, how it's non-visible. I mean, someone, you could hold a magnet and two magnets together and say like, I'm going to let one go and it's going to slide in and hit the other one. And someone that, you know, was a doubter, they would put their hand through the field. They would look at, I can't see anything, you know, my hands going through it. There's no lines, you know, that's impossible, you know, and unless you showed them, you know, they would say that's absolute baloney. You know, there's no way, you know, this material over here is going to slide over and connect with that material. You know, that's just not even a possibility. So there's so many things that, um, you know, our human mind can't conceive. But I think as soon as we start getting out of, you know, the conception of our human mind, we open the doors to, you know, these infinite, you know, uh, opportunities. And I think one of the keys to that um, is expressing gratitude. Um, uh, my, uh, my wife's grandfather used to say gratitude uh, is um, what lubricates the, uh, uh, the doors to the, um, <laughs> here I'm butchering it all. Gratitude is what lubricates the hinges on the door of opportunity. Um, and you know, it, it puts us into a frequent, yeah, isn't that powerful? It puts us into a frequency band where we can start to receive and, um, and, and play with, um, uh, you know, these, um, new ideas that, you know, are bound to come in. I mean, you look at, you know, we went from, you know, people selling the buggy whip, you know, people in the buggy whip business to now, you know, um, gas stations, you know, you know, Tesla charging stations, you know, and I know that has its own, you know, um, you know, thing that, you know, uh, will have to be worked through in terms of mining and, you know, pillaging the earth and all that kind of stuff. But there, we're just going to incrementally, you know, um, you know, continue to create technologies and stuff that uh, really benef- benefit human, you know, humankind. And you know, I know there's a lot of dark, you know, technologies out there, you know, as well, you know, seemingly, um, you know, about control and chipping and all that kind of stuff. But I think that will start to fade away as we raise our consciousness. If we stay in that uh, frequency band of fear, you know, and we're you know fearful about it, I think we're only really feeding that model. But if we start to step away and we focus on love and kindness and joy, even in our own individual realities, it starts to form, you know, and blossom and, and change. And the people that are um, focused on, you know, those uh, technologies that wouldn't be considered helpful um, and, and are controlling and uh, hurtful, those people's minds will start to, you know, shift, you know, too. They'll start to be like, wake up. It's it's sort of like the uh, Amazing Grace, the slave trader. You know, he was, um, you know, uh, involved in the slave trade. And um, and then one day it just hit him, uh, you know, what on earth are we doing? These are, you know, beautiful human beings and, uh, and we're selling them and we're abusing them. And, you know, and so he, uh, you know, he woke up and it, it can take, you know, someone that's doing something so dark to just all of a sudden get it. And so the more coherence that we can, you know, put out in our own lives and, and the love that we um, project out and send, you know, it has a, a huge effect. And so then he went on to, you know, being an abolitionist, you know, for the rest of his life and trying to make a difference. And, and he did, you know, make some. So if we come back to the idea of the I, I want to kind of couple the idea of love and fear with these new technologies that are coming out because if it goes back to the Nikola Tesla thing where you know I the conspiracy theory is and honestly this conversation is aiding that conspiracy theory in my opinion that you know you can't make money off of free energy so you know he was killed and all of his technology was destroyed essentially in the fires and whatever. So, you know, in that answer, you kind of said that the technology for free energy already exists, but people essentially have been silenced, which would be out of fear. So, you know, and I'm not, I guess, advocating that if anyone's ever been threatened, you know, to release sort of free energy type stuff to ever come out because of their life or family and all this other stuff. But where, where comes the line of, you know, doing things in the face of fear, but, you know, and, and maybe there's even the thing where it gets squashed because they did squash essentially the, you know, the, uh, water powered engine that we saw back 30 years ago, 50, wait, well, I guess it would be 40 or 50 years ago at this point. 
You know what I mean though? Do you kind of see where I'm going with this question of like, where's the balance of, you know, not doing things out of fear because I totally, I I get it. Like if I create something that replaces oil and you know, a ton of people from the oil industry, the government, nobody wants that. Like, you know, and I've even seen with, I think uh, like Tesla and electric cars is that you still need oil in order to produce the electricity or you still need coal or, you know, there's still, you know, byproduct from electricity that it's kind of a smoke screen in a sense that we're not, we're not really doing much with electric cars. Like though we think we are, it's not, it's just like removing you from the fuel, the, where we burn the fossil fuels essentially. Yeah. (laughs) So, you know, it it comes to my question of where's the level of, of fear versus love and knowing kind of where you come with those technologies. Like if, if something like if you were to get a download of some technology that would completely revolutionize the car industry or, you know, the oil industry or make these industries outdated yet, you know, the big brother comes knocking on your door and says, Hey, if you release this, we're going to, you know, suicide you kind of thing. Like where, Mm -hmm. and I, I guess I dance on this question, but does that make sense where the question's kind of coming from? Like, how do you balance that? You know, I think, um, you know, I think there's a couple of things, you know, uh, one is, um, you know, if you're given that information and, um, and your, um, your primary focus in the world is the frequency of love and coherence, um, that you will be shown and given ways um, to protect yourself, you know, as you present that technology, if you are supposed to indeed bring it forward. And through that resonance, you will be uh, repelled by those that would have ulterior motives, or at least it'll be made very clear um, that that might not be someone you want to partner with. Um, And, uh, and then uh, attracted to those that, you know, would be able to assist, you know, um, you know, so that's one part of it. The other part is, is the rest of the the planet has to be at uh, a frequency band where that can be brought through. So even though the technology might be complete and ready, it can't be wheeled out until the vibration on the planet is, you know, high enough because, um, you know, uh, a lot of the technologies that, you know, are amazing and available. They can be misused. And the first thing, you know, people say is how can we use this to destroy, you know, this country or whatever, you know, or, uh, you know, so if that's the mentality, it wouldn't be allowed to come out. Um, uh, um, and so I think we would get higher dimensional help, you know, higher aspects of ourselves, whatever you want to call it would, would block that from being able to come forward. Um, and if we pushed through, to try to bring it forward when you're getting the red light. Uh, you know, I think that's when sometimes people, you know, get taken out for bringing these things in is because, um, they're getting the message. Don't do it or don't do it yet. Or don't do it in this way, but they, through human will, Maybe override their ego. that system. Maybe their ego. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Huh? Yeah. That's a fascinating way to put it. So then why would they, oh, okay. So then, but then why, I guess the question would be is why would higher beings, higher dimensional entities present that information to an individual if the conscious collective of the world isn't ready for it? It's a great question. You know, I think it comes back to um, what we touched on with the four minute mile is um, someone creating it. Maybe they're playing their role, you know, in society of bringing it forward, even though, no one sees it or it doesn't go anywhere is because now that frequency, you know, is now on the planet, making it easier for the next guy um, because it's already been designed. And, uh, um, and then, you know, maybe the next guy is supposed to play a different role or another role or another part of it. Um, You know, that's what I would surmise, you know, from, from that. Um, Yeah. Yeah. It's, I guess it's, it's a, it's a, (laughs) yeah, it's a question that you almost, you have to assume that there's a different layer that it's meant for, right? Or maybe there's, mm-hmm. maybe it's supposed to send the seeds of mistrust on a global or higher scale to, I don't know, push people in a certain direction, whether it's towards it or away from it. Or, you know, I, I guess it's one of those things that time will tell kind of thing. It's not, you have to look at it yeah. in retrospect as opposed to trying to figure it out now. 
Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <sighs> Damn. Well, Ross, I feel like that's an amazing <laughs> spot to wrap up this conversation. Um, yeah, this has been, this great. is incredible. I mean, thank you for coming on. I love this yeah. conversation in the next couple of weeks. I'm going to be working with like a channeler to open up my channel and, Oh, I great. know I've, I've had lucid dreams before and I've, I actually had a lucid dream where I astral projected. So I'm like, she's, she just opens it and then it's like, okay, figure out what realm you want to go to. And I already know <laughs> that the astral realm is like my first <laughs> is what's calling it. <laughs> Your first yeah, stop. it's my first stop, <laughs> um, which is interesting. Cause that'll actually probably, I will have my session. I think the first day, the first day I have my meeting with her is actually the first day that this episode is getting released or is the day this is released. Oh, cool. Yeah. So oh, it might be some divine timing right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, That's awesome. I usually left, leave this time for my guests. If you want to say anything to the audience, encourage them. I mean, you've dropped incredible wisdom already, <laughs> but if you want to throw like just mm-hmm. the cherry on top of the cake, like this is your time. I will also grab all of your links and throw them down in the show notes. So you can reference those as well. Um, so, the floor is yours. Oh, well, thank you so much. Uh, I just uh, greatly appreciate it and be on your channel here and, and uh, really support what you're doing in the, uh, the world and, and making these ideas more uh, prevalent and, um, you know, having topics and, and discussions, you know, that, um, you know, you don't hear at most dinner tables. No. <laughs> so, um, but I, I, the biggest thing that I, you know, would like to do is just, um, uh, just let people know that, you know, there's amazing abilities, you know, uh, within you and that you, um, have so much love and, um, uh, universal love towards you. And I want you to know how important you are, uh, you know, on this planet and what you guys are, are here to do. And it may seem like, you know, we're just playing, you know, uh, you know, a role that we wouldn't define as, as you know, you know, something, you know, big that we're doing, however, you're holding the space, um, you know, you, just your vibrational frequency being here, um, and what you're doing is, is enough. And so, um, just, uh, just start to play and open up doors of, of, uh, windows of opportunity and see, you know, um, what else you can, you know, uh, express and, and, uh, you have amazing self-healing capabilities, intuitive capabilities and perceptive capabilities in you, in you, uh, in each one of us. And they're just, um, you know, ready to be utilized and access. So, um, that would be the, the message that I would leave. I love it. I also see that, uh, I was checking up your website and I saw that you guys have, um, maybe you have some products in New York and I'll definitely ask you about it a bit more, but I'm, I'm excited yeah. to see, uh, I'm in Pittsburgh now, but I'm going to be in New York in a couple of weeks. And so I'm, I want to sit on that mat. I, I love meditating. And so I, I can't, I can't wait to test oh, yeah. that out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's one right in New York city and, uh, um, I, they just got it up on their website maybe a week ago. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. They have that and they have a quantum flow unit and they have a core harmonizer there. So oh. yeah, definitely check it out. It's I fun. might spend a whole day in there. Just a little kid in a playground. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you know how that goes. Yeah, definitely. Well, Ross, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. On behalf of all the conscious monkeys, uh, guys, check out his stuff down below. I mean, even just give his website a look over. I mean, it he's got products there from twenty two dollars to sixty eight thousand dollars. <laughs> so he's got a, <laughs> no matter your budget, he's got something for you that you could check out. Um, wow, like this is insane. If I ever have invention questions or astral realm type stuff, I we might have to have you on in the future because this is this is wild to say the least. I really appreciate you coming on. I really love talking about this because, you know, it's, it's now I'm thinking about it, it's really mixing the worlds of the logical engineering brain and the astral, you know, spiritual intuitive side of things. So hopefully this had a little piece of everything for everyone. So you could like get a little cross the aisle action going. I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm rambling now guys. Thank you so much for listening. If you made it this far, Thank you even more. Um, Go check out all of Ross's amazing inventions at the websites below. And with that being said, let's keep growing together. 